Now entering Nerdist.com. Tonight, my guest has been to not one but two of the most massive franchises in the history of entertainment. Uh, he's gotten to be a lovable hobbit. He's endured one of the most heartbreaking television deaths on one of my favorite TV shows, Lost. And if that weren't enough, he's an incredible adventurer. He's been all over the world. Uh, he has a show called Wild Things, and, and it's essentially a quest to showcase the most exotic insects and animals. Uh, I've been friends with this guy for a number of years. I'm inspired by the way that he pursues anything that he's passionate about. It's one of the main reasons why I want to have him on the show. Uh, he's in one of the most disturbing horror films that I've ever seen, called Pet, which you should watch. Uh, and he has a new film called Atomica that we're going to talk about tonight. Dominic Monaghan is talking with Chris Hardwick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me figure out how to... Let me figure out how to... This is very... This is very great. By the way, you've sent in questions from every pl platform using at talking, which will be our handle, is our handle across all the platforms. Uh, we're going to have video chats tonight. People right here in our studio audience are going to ask questions of their own. We're going to talk for a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to force Dominic to answer those questions in the nicest way. We're going to force you to answer Good. questions. Just before we begin, can I get rid of this cushion? You can get rid of the cushion oh, if you want. I, I want my guests to be comfortable. Issue with cushions. What do you not like about I don't, cushions? Right, so, like, here we go. But, okay. like, so you have the back, you have the seat that you sit on. Yeah, right? that's how that works. And then you've got the spinal thing that I kind do, of makes yep. things straight. And then yes. the cushion. You don't like the cushion puts for the support in your spine. Well, you don't have to sit like Gu you don't have to sit like Gumby. Like I you just, I don't understand. I don't understand the function. It's a. It's for lumbar support. If you have maybe a, a hot. Uh, bowl of soup. And you then you can put it over your lap, like you know, or if you have a laptop to protect your... In terms your... of the lap thing, every time they do it on a plane, you know, when they give you a cushion, I'm like, yeah. I don't You don't want I... that cushion? Just... Hey, just fuck the cushion. Yeah, get out of here. Mine's hiding a backup microphone in case our mics die, and it's hiding my phone, uh, which I, if I don't have it within proximity of me, I, my brain melts. I'm having, like, in the past couple of years, so major problems with my phone in terms of my connection to it and the way that I feel about it. You mean, like, like too much of an addiction yeah i just i, I i'm start I, i've been having some anxiety with the fact that i can't seem to get myself away from my phone in terms of the life that i have and the career that i have and i've said for a long time now i want to not have a cell phone and obviously my agent says that's ridiculous <laughs> my mom and dad are like oh that's fine do it but my agent's like you can't not have a cell phone and i said well you know not that i'm bill murray but you know bill murray has an answer machine and not an agent supposedly and people just call him i feel like machine. bill murray has like a carrier pigeon that just <laughs> finds him wherever he is and then he gets a thing and then he just shows up yeah like at a bar mitzvah or something but you know those things where you 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 say those comments and then eventually you have to get to a point where you say i can't keep just saying this i have to you actually have to do it, yeah. And, and I'm not... I think generations underneath us obviously have major problems with not being able to get away from their phone. And I'm not completely impossible, oh, yeah. but it, it makes me feel anxious. And from a physical point of view, I have problems with the end of my index finger, the end of my middle finger, and a little section of my hand. Oh, a poor little monkey. You oh. okay? Is your hand okay? No, but I'm serious. It's, it's, see that little dark section there? <laughs> this is, by the way, this, for a man, this is a severe injury. You have to understand... <laughs> We have low pain thresholds. Look, it's, it's like, all... Yeah, I know. But honestly, this is, this is not like... <laughs> but no, but it's, it's not the weight of the phone. Yeah, I feel like a little... the badness of the, of the mobile phone... It's getting into your phone. It's going in the radiation, the, the evilness think... of it. I mean, th there, there's no question that there is... That, that we uh, have an addiction, that there is a tremendous social media addiction. Mm. I, I mean, I, it feels weird when you don't have it near you and you just feel like... Well, I, I'm disconnected from everything that's going on. Yeah. But if you spent, you know, if you'd really lost your phone and you lived away somewhere for a few days, you would readjust. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. Like, I, I go to Peru usually for about three weeks at the end of the year, and there's no cell phones that work there. And for the first day or two, that my friends that I'm with, because I'm a little bit more used to it now, my friends that I'm with are, are, are anxious about, you know, doing this and stuff. And I say, what, it will not work, it will not work, don't even try it. And then what you, what you find is that at dinner time, at lunch time, in terms of social situations, yeah. everyone's much more chatty and the, the anxiety kind of 
leaves us, you know. In some way, I slightly blame you for my phone. <laughs> no, seriously. OK, I'll take the blame. Why? Because years ago, when I did Attack of the Show... Yeah, you and G4, I, yeah. You and May I, yeah. SMP. Good job. You, you and I were chatting backstage. Poor a little out for Attack of the Show. Yeah. <laughs> you, you and I were, were chatting backstage, and, and I said, how do I get more Twitter followers? Because you, you had such an incredible following. And you told me some of the things that I needed to do, and then I started to get a slight addiction to Twitter, which every, every like, uh, probably four or five times a year, I'll just delete Twitter from my phone for a couple of months. And I'll say on social media, hey, I'm going to jump off this for a while, because my Instagram photos go directly to my Twitter. So sure, yeah, like. so it's all, yeah. The, the difference for me is, like, it feels like Instagram, if you want it to be, Instagram can just be photos. You just put up a photo and then go, and yeah. that's it. You don't have to read comments. Twitter feels like a bunch of gossipy... Well, it's hard. You know, it's hard, and it's also because it, social media has conditioned us to think that every time your brain fires off an emotion, you need to put it on social media. <laughs> and so a lot of times you're, you, you can get into a, a, a thing with someone, and then they're like, oh, I don't even think that anymore. I just had that thought, <laughs> and I wasn't even paying attention. Like, what do you think it is about humanity in particular that is so that it just plays to our greatest weakness because it tricks you into thinking you're connected it's good for work it's good to find out what's going on but really it's so much of it is just like a security blanket an ego pursuit what do you think it is yeah i don't know i mean i wonder if that warhol thing about everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes puts us into that social media place of like i have a voice and it's relevant but i think there's some damaging elements certainly in terms of Twitter and Facebook, which I've not been on for, like, over a decade now, because I, I found that really toxic, I, in the sense that... <laughs> it is really... It is. Don't man. ever... Yeah, don't... Gossipy, listen. nasty You stuff. post stuff on Facebook, but don't ever read the top comments. No, no, no. <laughs> don't ever read the top but comments. I, I, I feel like, like... Like you said, people can hide behind that little... You know, bird egg Twitter. -y it's it's, egg. Uh, it's legitimately weaponized anonymity, and I think people forget. You know, because they. I think sometimes people bundle free speech in with anonymous free speech, and I sort of feel like free speech is a right that we have. Being anonymous is a privilege. Yeah. And I think people weaponize that privilege, and and then it, to some, it feels like it's the most cowardly of all acts. So you're going to go after someone, and they don't know who you are, and you're going to get away with it. Where's the? Yeah, I mean the Leslie Jones stuff was just disgusting. It was actually. abysmal. Yeah. And, and, I mean, for you, it must be worse, because you, in some way, kind of represent that Twitter thing and the... It's not that... I mean, listen, I, I, I whine about it. <laughs> you were, though. I, I, whine, I whine about it to my wife sometimes, and, and, and you know, she's like, what are you doing? Because it really isn't... Um, I don't get it that bad. You know, people just go... You, your fucking face is dumb, and I'll go, aw. And uh, or they'll but, go... But you do get a lot of traffic, and you I have a lot of I do get a lot followers. of traffic, and so as your traffic goes up, your percentage of trolling goes sure, up, and sure. some people just want to fuck with you, and that's the way it is. And, you know, but if that's the worst of it, I mean, people, you know, I, I feel like, like in, like in Leslie's case, for instance, like, I, I don't... I've never experienced that level of yeah. disrespect and vitriol, and so, you know, for me mm. to say... Like, you know, when on Walking Dead, when, ne when they didn't find out who Negan killed at the end of season six, that was as much toxicity as I've ever felt from the internet before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People were very upset. They thought that I had something to do with that in some way. Uh, I realized I was Walking Dead customer service at that point. <laughs> but, but, like... <laughs> I mean, but, but it's exactly why... You know, people, it's like about fans having ownership, you know? And I, and I, I struggle with this problem a lot, and I wonder, like, is fandom broken right now? Because mm. when Lost was on the air, that's definitely a show that could have had an after show that I certainly would have hosted. <laughs> sure, for sure. Because every episode, it, you know, there were so many characters, there were so many storylines, so much drama, so many the overarching themes, philosophical themes, spiritual themes. And so, uh, you know, I wonder for you guys, like, what do you think that would have been like if that had been in full swing during Lost? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, people have said that to me. They said, look, look at these tiny characters in Game of Thrones that have, like, a million and a half followers. And right. think about what would happen if Lost was on while social media was around. Not only that, but we, we filmed Lost on Oahu. And, and in, in a lot of different ways, that sheltering of being on the island kept us away from that stuff. I mean, I, I don't think any of us... I mean, we knew, we knew it was a big show, but I don't think any of us really realised how big until we moved from the island to places like... I remember going to Disneyland at one point and thinking, I can't do this at the moment. And then 
I don't know why, but it was huge in Spain. My family live in Spain. My brother lives in Spain. My parents live in Spain. Oh, muy bien. Yeah, gracias. And, um... And that's all my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I think because in England it moved from a terrestrial uh, channel to a digital channel, so it lost a few followers. In Spain it was just on their major channel. The sure. Entire time. Massive deal. So even now, like, walking around Barcelona or Madrid or Seville, it's much more of a big deal than it is, uh, you know, in, in Manchester or London and stuff. Um... I don't know. I, I, I always took the stance of I'm not a writer, I'm just a character. So it's, it's the equivalent of shouting, uh, um, shouting at Huckleberry Finn for something that Mark Twain did. Right. You know, like, <laughs> it's got, it's got, never I've never heard it put that true. way before. It's That's true. fantastic. Like, it's, it's got nothing to do with me, you know? Hey, what are you doing on that stupid raft? Why would you throw me here? paid for it. Please, you know? stop yelling at me. So the, the, we were attributed quite a bit of blame. Luckily, the character that I played, for the most part, was a good person. If you play a despicable character, like Michael Emerson's character, right. he, he had told me at a convention that, you know, obviously it blurs the lines. People would come over to you and say, you're a horrible person. It's like, <laughs> I'm actually just an actor playing a horrible person, you know? But... Uh, that type of stuff happens all the time, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a great show to be involved with, but I think... I don't know, man. It's, it's, a, it's a weird kind of poison chalice, those things, because, like, I am always aware of what will eventually be your epitaph, you know? And I always think, oh, they're going to say, like, he was in Lord of the Rings or he was in Lost. And I think, God, is that the accumulation of my entire life that I was in these things? No, but I do think, when, I do think someday, let's say 100 years from now when you die, you're missing a huge opportunity if your tombstone is not a hand that says, not Penny's boat. Written. <laughs> and, uh, this has to be... So two things. First of all... If you guys at home have any uh, suggestions for what we could call the after show for Lost, uh, hashtag talking, uh, let us know. I'm kind of curious to see what people think. Remember, I, I was at a party with uh, a J.J. Abrams' house, and I was talking to his dad, who's a lovely guy, and uh, we were talking about that moment. <clears throat> and he said in all of the TV programs that he's ever seen, in all of the things that he's been exposed to through J.J.'s career and just watching TV in general, he said that moment broke his heart, and I was like, oh, well, I guess we achieved the thing that we said. It's one of the most heartbreaking deaths. I mean, everyone, you know, Charlie just represented that guy who he was trying, he was trying to do the right thing, and right. he stumbled along the way, and he had some success and some failure, and, you know, we wanted it to work out with Claire, and it just, you know, it's like the, the whole thing. Yeah, there's a humanity about him which I really appreciated. I mean, we're not all good, we're not all bad, but Charlie was trying to be... Good. And any time you put a baby into a situation like that, it's going to make people cry, you know? Yeah, I mean, there, there, were, like, there were episodes of Lost. It was like the one when, when the dog, like, swims, like, swims out. It was like, not the dog, too! <laughs> like, just every... You know, that, that show was such a great... It was such a great ushering in of kind of what I think modern uh, uh, lifestyle television shows can be, where yeah. it really gripped... Because I remember, like, even during commercial breaks, they would have stuff for the, uh, like, the Hanzo Foundation and then, like, Dharma and all yeah. these secrets. Did you guys ever do any of the... What are you guys talking about over there? <laughs> you know we can literally hear everything you're doing, right? <laughs> you're still doing it. <laughs> huh? It's, yeah. Do you guys, are you guys okay on your camera? <laughs> Someone's in trouble. Do you even know who that guy is? <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, well, I, I think there's, there's, as we know, when we watch TV and, and it's our favourite show or, or it's, um, it's something that, you know, we come back to week by week, there's, there's the things that we know that work about our favourite show, our favourite characters, the, the location, the storylines, and then there's that, there's that thing, that intangible thing that you just can't put your finger on, that the reason why you love Star Trek so much, the reason why you love The Walking Dead so much, the reason why you love Star Wars so much... And the thing about Lost, certainly for me, the first year, uh, I mean, the, the show is incredible, but that first season of the show, when we would watch it and we were all together, they, they added a beautiful chemistry. You've got, you know, you've got the flawed good guy, you've got the flawed uh, heroine character, you've got a guy who you can't quite trust, you've got someone who seems to be noble and fantastic location and mystery and stuff. And you was... got Hurley? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's just... There's, there's, there's something about it. They've, they've added that magic concoction. I think between JJ and Damon, they sat down and said, you know, if we're, if we're going to 
have this opportunity. Let's throw in everything that it takes to yeah. create a great show. You know? Yeah. But did you, how far into the series did you, you, you did they tell you early on, like, Charlie's going to have this arc and, you know, around season, was it probably around season four, maybe, or season five? When I left. Yeah. No, I left end of season three. It's season three. It's season three. Lots so, of people say that to me. Lots of people say, so when do you leave, uh, you I know, feel, season I feel like five, it was season six? Than that. No, because I came back quite a bit. But when Charlie actually, you know, croaked was end of season three. <laughs> I, I had said to Damon, Damon and I were, t were friends right Damon from Lindelof, the start. Yeah. Damon Lindelof, co-creator. I said to Damon right from the start, if you ever leave, like, I'll, I'll leave with you if, you if you're into it. And he said, oh, well, that's, that's good to know, you know, kind of politically and just, you know, from a, from a show point of view. And then as we got into season three and started to explore this idea with, you know, Desmond kind of saying, I've seen your destiny and it involves your death. Damon and I started talking. He said, look, I think we can write a really fantastic arc for you. But in writing that arc, it puts us into this, you know, place where you have to leave. Or we can explore a way that this arc doesn't happen for you. And I thought, I don't know if I'm going to get a better opportunity to make a difference in this show as opposed to dying with a group of people or sure. dying at the end or, or just being in the background with the baby or, or, or with Claire. So, uh, so that was kind of how it happened. That, that's not to say that there weren't elements of being disappointed when it happened or, or feeling like, have I done the right thing? But ultimately, from, from making an effect, I think I, I definitely did the right thing. Yeah, because you guys have to understand, it is very difficult not only to get on a show, but get on a show that stays on the air and then have that show be a hit show. Yeah. So to kind of help make the choice to leave is a, that's, not, that's a, that's scary as fuck, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you never know, this business is so mercurial and you don't know. So how do you, you know, how do you as, as Dom go, you know, this is right, this serves the story, but I'm still, there are other things that I know I'm going to be able to go on to do or I'm going to be okay. How do you know you're going to be okay? Yeah, I work on instincts a lot and I, you know me by now, I like scary shit, you know. I, <laughs> I, 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 I like things that, that force me to be in the moment and being in the moment for me is is either being around kids because they always force you to be in the moment yeah or around animals or putting yourself into a life uh situation where you're like it could go one way or the other and i'm not i'm not playing it safe I, i'm not interested in playing things safe you know uh in terms of like what you said you know a, a show is they always talk about this thing of like uh, lightning in a bottle you know capturing lightning in a bottle my my brother and my dad who obviously i adore are extremely snobby about TV and film, you know. <laughs> so I'll be like, you know, what what do you think of this? And they go, ah, it was all right, but I didn't really like it. And I'm always I'm always saying to them, guys, just to write that thing and get it accepted, just to have that thing that's accepted, get the money to turn it into a a film, just yeah. to cast it even slightly correctly. All of these working parts to get yourself on set. And in a, in a heartbeat, you're like, nah, I didn't like the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, you know, that, that is, it's kind of funny, it's just going back to the social media thing, that, that, that is one thing that totally gets under my skin, is, is when people are just dismissive of stuff, like, what did you make for the last three months, yeah, yeah, you know? Exactly. Like, yeah. this shit's hard, come yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. you know? They, they say, it's, you know, it's rubbish or whatever, or they do this, you know, I'm obviously a big Manchester United fan, and, and lots of people, yeah, oh, no, nice, yeah. nice. uh, that's cricket, yeah. soccer. Yeah, L lots of people who don't appreciate a certain player will say, you know, he's rubbish or he's fat. This guy Wayne Rooney, who scored more goals for Manchester United than any other player in the history of football, 250 goals. Uh, he's uh, I already forgot everything you just said. <laughs> My, my brain does not absorb sports, but so, I understand he's good. So to put it into context, he scored more goals for England than any other player, scored more goals for Manchester United, the most successful English team of all time, than any other player. He's a record-breaker times two in, a, in an elite fashion. And people say, he's rubbish, he's fat, he's crap. He's not fat, do you know what I mean? He, <laughs> he might look slightly bigger than other players, but if you put him with the man on the street running, he would slay you, he'd absolutely slay yeah. you. And his skill level, like, he might not be as good as the elite players he plays around now, but his skill level in terms of, like, you or, not, you or I, yeah. he'd make us look like we're wearing shoes on the wrong foot. I tell you, I, for one, am shocked. I personally expected more from soccer fans. I had <laughs> no idea that it was so toxic. And oh, so my God. When you want to talk about toxicity and fandom, yeah, yeah. like, that, that's where you... I mean, listen, I might get shit online for nerd stuff, but... I, I won't get fucking murdered if I wear a Star Wars thing in a Star Trek bar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, that's... It's pretty hardcore. That is... You want to talk about lifestyle fandom, that is, like, a really attaching your core beliefs and values to a thing. Yeah. 
It, it is pretty hardcore, and I, and I did, I mean, I'm from Manchester, I did, uh, you know, jump on that ship a long time ago, and I'm, I'm not leaving. One of my uncles said to me a while ago, when, when Manchester City, the rival team of Manchester United, were on the rise, he said, I think you backed the wrong horse. And I said, well, what, am I going to jump off that horse and jump on another one now? What type of integrity would that show? I'm going to stick right. with the team that I supported all my life, you know? And they bring me a lot of uh, adventure and a lot of drama, but, like... You know, we, we play on Saturday. I'm going to be up at 4.30 in the morning to watch the game. Oh, wow. And it completely changes my mood over the weekend and, and the coming week, you know. But, yeah, um, if I'm in Liverpool, I'm always looking over my shoulder a little bit. Because <laughs> um, that's our main rival, you know. You're not, you're not a sports fan, period. I don't. You know, my brain does not absorb it. Both my parents, my mom uh, is a rabid sports fan. My dad was a rabid sports My mom, like, legit calls into sports talk radio shows. And... <laughs> What, what's her sport swears. and what's her team? She's uh, football, college football, basketball, college basketball, baseball. Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> tennis, golf. Like, she watches, she watches everything. I remember I, I, call, I called her. I came home from a trip, and it was the... It was, it was whatever... Um, oh, fuck! I can't remember any of the goddamn... Uh, you really uh, are bad. Oh, yeah. oh, yes, I am. Uh, what to, oh, Fuck, I'm so embarrassed I'm going to ask this question. Please don't be mad at me. <clears throat> what team does Aaron Rodgers play for? Packers. The Packers. The only reason I know that is because I'm friends with his girlfriend, Olivia Munn. That's the only reason that I know that. Uh, he's a very nice guy. He's a very nice man. Uh, very sweet. Obviously very talented. But it was when they were in the playoffs before the, you know, the couple of weeks before the Super Bowl. And I called my mom. That guy got him from a trip. I always call my mom when I land to make, make her let her know I'm okay. Yeah, shut up about it. <laughs> And so I go, hey. And she goes, oh, did you get in okay? Yeah. And she was like, well, it's, you know, it's raining. You want to be a little girl? What the fuck are you doing there? What are they doing? They did this to Aaron Rodgers last year. Well, if they're going to fuck him, they might as well take him to dinner first. <laughs> so is your seatbelt on? Are you wearing your seatbelt? Like, she yeah, just... Sure. Yeah, she's just, like, that kind of a sports fan. But for you... At Nerdist Mom on Twitter. You should follow her. She's hilarious. Nice. Um, when she's but, but for you growing up, it's like, like, I can't retain numbers and math doesn't work in my head either. For you, is it that? You can't remember scores, you can't remember players, you don't understand... You understand the sport, right? It just doesn't interest. You know what sounds weird is that, yeah, it's that if I can picture myself doing something then it is of interest to me, and maybe that's just a part of my inherent flawed narcissism. Uh, and then people are like, well, how come you like Harry Potter so much? And I'm like, because I can fucking picture being a wizard. That's why. So, that's... But, I mean, I think there's some... I can't picture throwing a ball at someone and having him catch it and go, yeah, points. Yeah, you... <laughs> You have to be an absolute tank to be an American football player, but I think you'd be a pretty good, like, pool player. <laughs> I'm good at darts. Table tennis. You know, anything that's inside, anything that's inside. I I'm... love shuffleboard. Shuffleboard's love great. Shuffleboard. Yeah. Shuffleboard's great. I can picture myself being on... Oh, Doctor Who? Yeah, I yeah. I can picture myself being a... Yeah, yeah, you, you're you're a Doctor, Doctor Who fan. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. What do you... What, you know, Capaldi's maybe going to leave? He's leaving? He is leaving, right? For is sure? he leaving after... Is that he's going to leave? What, are they doing another episode, another two episodes? I think maybe just the Christmas episode might be the... I think, is it the Christmas episode maybe going to be the last one? But he's he's wrapping it up. Did you did you pr throw your name into the hat? Did you, I, you know, an American cannot... The, I think one of the rules is an American cannot play... I mean... It, it's like a Bond thing. It's kind of like a Bond thing. And there are, you know, Matt Myra has a theory that James Bond is a Time Lord, and that's why he is. Mm, that's I like how he's that, in it. I like that. But, you know, some name, uh, one name that I saw being thrown around was Tilda Swinton that I think would that. be amazing yeah, at yeah. Tilda Swinton. But would you, would you consider would Yeah, that be something I, for you? I, I stuck my name out there just because I think you have to when it comes to Doctor Who because it's such a fandom. <laughs> so. But again, you're like haunting me on social media. When I saw you do that thing where you said, I'm reading that, you know, Tilda Swinton might be yeah. a potential name for the doctor, she'd be amazing. I read that and I went, oh, fuck, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> she is fantastic, Tilda Swinton. I loved her in Doctor Strange, that moment. Oh, yeah. The moment where she realizes that she's struggling with her death, that beautiful moment where she says, I've been here so many times and right at this you moment... can't see past yeah, that. Yeah, I can't work out what to do. I just thought that was a beautiful... I feel like she's the ancient one. And, but then she's also great in Snowpiercer. Did you see Snowpiercer? Yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. She, everything she's in, she's just so... She's brilliant in the beach. She's so sexy in the beach. Yeah. I find her really sexy and uh, very kind of mysterious and very time lordy. Um, <laughs> would, uh, you, would you... If you were a doctor, do you have a signature? Like, what would your... Well, signature? my whole thing is curiosity, right? I mean, I, I like, grew up uh, with this... So you dress like a cat? 
<laughs> I'm the cat doctor, meow. <laughs> I, I grew up with this quote from Einstein, which is, um, blessed are the curious, for they shall have adventures. Sure. And I always thought, wow, that's, a, that's an amazing quote. And I have this sticker that says, be curious, which we give out to people whenever we go traveling. So I think the idea for me as a doctor would be... Uh, I'm interested in the minutia. I'm interested in how things work. I'm interested right. in, in the microscopic thing. I have microscopes around my house and, you know, obviously interested in insects, insects which are the smallest type of uh, animals, apart from bacteria and stuff. Um, so I like the little things and how the little things p come together to make big things. So I think the vibe of my doctor would be one of curiosity and examination, more of a literal doctor in right that sense you know someone examining stuff a detective type thing um but i'm trying to i'm trying to work out what's missing from the from the doctor now like what what is needed and i, and I think maybe a woman doctor would be a great i think it'd be great you know? yeah i think it'd be great because then it I opens mean, it all up yeah because obviously a man can come back but if well, it's, it's, they're aliens. The Time Lords are aliens. They could be, like, it's a concept of gender right. here. Human gender and physiology doesn't, necess doesn't have to, you know, I mean, sure. I know they got two hearts, but, you know, it doesn't, doesn't yeah. really, beyond that. And, and Tilda Swinton, who, who's beautiful and statuesque, she does have an alien-like quality to her, you know? Very like, ethereal. An otherworldly yeah. thing. So I think she'd be great. I heard Kate Blanchett was being talked about as well. But, really? Yeah. Holy shit. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> hard she, now. She'd be things. a great master. I think she'd be a great yeah, master. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've never, you, you you know, she's just so she could she just gets so absorbed in everything that she does. Yeah, I think she'd be such a great. I think she'd be a great master. I agree. There, there was two TV shows that terrified me when I was a kid. Uh, one was I don't know if you guys remember Words or Gummidge. I don't even think it came out over here. Those aren't real words. No, well, <laughs> it has a slight it has a slight <laughs> Doctor Who uh, connection because John Pertwee played uh -huh. Words yep. or Gummidge, and it, so it's the story of a, of a scarecrow who's, based on his personality, able to take his head off and replace his head with, like, evil Wurzel or, like... It's a children's show? Yes, yeah, children's show. It's terrifying. <laughs> so he'd, like, twist his head around and then put on, like, you know, athletic Wurzel or, like, smart Wurzel or evil Wurzel, which was terrifying. So my mum and dad said that I would be uh, scared of that. And then in, the, in Doctor Who, when the, you have that explosion at the end of the yeah. uh, closing... or Was it the closing credits or the opening credits where you'd have the big explosion? Maybe the closing credits. For which... Doctor Who. It, yeah. would, it would go ping. Like, oh, at the, at, the, well, at the very end? At the, very, at the beginning, was... there was the ping, and then it would go through, and then at the end. So at the end, I think when I was a kid, the very end credits, it would, you know, show the director, and then it'd go Pow! And my mum and dad said I'd be, like, hiding behind the sofa. <laughs> so it's been a big thing in my life, Doctor Who, and um, the, the, the fandom of it has changed over the years. I remember going to New Zealand and seeing Pete Jackson, and one of the first things he said to me within, like, 20 minutes, said, are you watching Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Hardcore, Pete. Like, not well, seen him for a couple of years, and that was his question. I do want to. I do want to get to some Lord of the Rings stuff uh, later in the show, but I, I, I want to talk about Atomica. First of all, I want to tell you that Pet is one of the most disturbing films I've ever seen. Oh yeah, you guys should watch it. I really like that film. It's great. You, you'll watch the trailer and you'll think it's one kind of movie, but it is not that kind of movie at all. True. It, it completely surprises you. But you play such a delightful fucking creep in that movie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching it. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I was talking with, with a friend of mine uh, last week, and they said, you know, is there a movie that you've done that there's a chance that I might have seen? I said, there's quite a lot of movies. There. <laughs> but he said, well, what, what's something that I should hunt out and find? And, and I said, you should watch Pet, because um, Pet came about in between seasons one and two of Lost. Uh, Jeremy Slater, who wrote uh, Fantastic Four and, and the recent Exorcist uh, TV show, uh, they sent this script and they said, oh, he wrote it for you. And I didn't really believe that he wrote it for me at the time. And then I met him in L.A. and he said, no, I, I did write it for you based on watching you go in and out of these darker moments with Charlie in season one of Lost. And um, we were going to do it in between seasons one and two, but there was a writer's strike. Right, writer's I remember strike? that, yeah. And at the time, I think Melissa George was supposed to play Holly. And then when we came back around after the writer's strike, Melissa George couldn't do it because I think she was going to have a baby. And then we were looking for Holly, and it got put on the shelf. And, like, ten years went by. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And I was uh, doing this, um, this video game last year, which I can't remember the name of. Anyone remember the name of that, that video? Super Mario <laughs> Pac-Man. Some Xbox game. I think that's embarrassing. I can't remember Xbox Pac-Man. Probably. <laughs> um, and... Um, 
I'm not going to remember it. And uh, they called me and said, oh, Pet's up and running again. And I said, well, I'm, I'm 10 years older. So I met the director and said, wouldn't it be... It's almost like the same story that I had with uh, JJ about Charlie. I said, wouldn't it be even more tragic if this guy who's supposed to be in his mid-20s and is sad and has no friends and has a bad relationship with his family, never had a girlfriend, what if he was in his mid-30s and all those things are true? And the director said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So then we filmed it in... I'm glad it was uh, now, because I think it just made... It just made so, when you see the movie, it'll all make sense to you. And again, stick with it, because you'll think it's one kind of movie and you really need to see how it... Yeah. How it plays out. Because yeah. it's real uncomfortable in the beginning. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm supposed to, this is supposed to be the protagonist? Yeah. You know? Well, it, it says underneath a love story, and you just think, okay, this is going to be creepy guy meets girl, and he's going to be a, 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 like treating a poorly, and that's kind of the movie. But like Chris said, it's not. We would, we would watch it at these screenings, and we'd, I'd seen it so many times that I would jump out and get food or, or go get a cup of tea or something, and I'd come in for that moment where they go, oh, shit, <laughs> and then leave. There's the, a few of those moments the in there. The audience like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. And Ksenia Solo, who plays the girl, she was is great. absolutely fantastic. She's so great. what is Atomica? Do you want to tell me about Atomica? Yeah, Atomica, man. Uh, Atomica is this film that I did before Pet. It was originally called um, Deep Burial, it's a story of a lady who gets a call that a underground nuclear center base uh, has stopped communicating with the outside world. So she goes to check out why, they, why they've lost communication. When she gets there, she finds me. I play a character called Robinson, who seems to be a little crazy, but he has spent two years underground in this bunker on his own. And he tells her that the other gentleman that's in the bunker with him went crazy and tried to kill him. And he doesn't know where he is in this bunker. It's like two miles long, this bunker. So she tries to find him. When she eventually does find that guy, played by Tom Sizemore. Great Great. Casting. Great casting. Great. Tom Sizemore says, my character went crazy and tried to kill him. So it's a who done it, who do you trust, whilst the world is about to explode. Um, it's fun. It's myself, Sarah Habel, uh, Tom Sizemore. We filmed in Washington State in an in a actual non-working anymore, underground bunker. Oh, wow. Yeah, full of bats and owls and centipedes. <laughs> oh, I absolutely Oh, my God, it. that must have been like... Uh, I love it. stop playing with the bugs. We need to come to do this, please. <laughs> we need I to shoot it. now. I loved it. I love caves, and I love creatures that live in caves because they have all these adaptations that we don't have because we don't live in caves, and there'd be all these bizarre creatures, and, yeah, most people would get scared, and I'd be like, give me a minute, there's a bat over here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig through the poop and find some smaller insects. No, we can't do that, Dominic. Uh, we're going to keep talking to Dominic some more. We're going uh, to... Wait, where's the... You said turn to the steady camera. Where's the steady cam? The steady cam's way back there, so I can't, I can't actually turn to it. There he comes. <laughs> Just so I can see the light coming the rig. Okay. Uh, so we're going to keep talking to Dominic when we come back. We're going to take a short break. We're going to have fan questions. We're going to talk about Lord of the Rings. We're going to talk about wild things and insects. Uh, more with Dominic Monaghan on Talking with Chris Hardwick. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back to Talking with Chris Hardwick. I'm Chris Hardwick of Talking with Chris Hardwick. What a lucky coincidence. Uh, so we asked the Internet some lost after show names. Uh, here's a handful. Uh, Ad Dresser Look on Twitter says, uh, Talking all every... Oh. Talking all everybody. I guess I was supposed to sing that. <laughs> Alaska Joko says, lost for words. That's pretty good. Jared GC says, spoke monster. Uh, S. Lizrick says, the Dharma inquisitive. Uh, Jammer1508 says, not Penny's after show. Uh, that's a pretty good one. But then this one, this one I think might have actually been it. Brian J. 1987, lost in conversation. There it is. Perfect. Hit the table there. That actually worked out pretty well. Do you, uh, th I think this is from your Instagram. This is you and, uh, this is... That's me and Foxy. Yeah. yeah, that's you and Matthew Fox. What was this about at J.J. Abrams? Yeah, so, um, when we were shooting the pilot, uh, we talked about this idea, I, I explain it here in this thing, it's in Empire magazine. We, yeah. we talked about the idea that, uh, Charlie always wore this black hood. And I said, when he puts his hood up, he should adopt this slightly more dark Jedi Sith Lord type thing so that the audience get to know... So if the, if the audience watched Charlie walk away and in the, in the very last, you know, moments of that shot, he puts his hood up, the audience go, oh, my God, something's going to happen. <laughs> Charlie's shifting, Charlie's shifting. So we played on that, that idea. And if you watch Lost, whenever Charlie's got his hood up, something's going on. Something's going on. Yeah, either psychologically with him or something in the future is coming. It's like um, Oranges in The Godfather, right? Yes. Every time you see Oranges in The Godfather, someone's going to die. Now, did you... Uh... Did you call JJ and go, remember the hood thing? Right before Force Awakens. Remember when I did the hood thing? Should I be in this movie too? Man. I, like, 
JJ and I are, are friends enough that it's a, it's a very delicate balance with those Star Wars things, but I, um... Okay, I'll help you. JJ, what the fuck? Put him in a Star Wars movie! He can't tell you that, but I can say that because you're there and I'm here and you're probably not even watching this. There you go. Yeah, that's um, all right. I got you. Thanks, man. No, it's, it is a, it's a very delicate thing, and JJ and I did talk at length about Star Wars, and we continue to do it. I watched those films. I loved Rogue One. I saw oh, Rogue One three is... Three times at this It's cinema. fantastic. Fantastic, right? Yeah. And I got very... I got all dressed up in a Darth Vader costume, and it just <laughs> loved the whole thing. Um, I did, I did. That's great. Um, but uh, I... You know, you have to be careful, because obviously it's, it's, it's work, so... You, what you want to do in those situations is say, JJ, I love you. I know you're getting pressure from every single person on the planet to be in Star Wars, but I love Star Wars too. And then right. you just have to leave it like that. It's weird, right? I mean, you just you want to do it, but you then don't you... want it too much. We actually. We do have a live chat. Okay, we have a live chat, actually. Someone's going to li li live Skype. Did we say Skype or chat? Do you want to say live chat? Okay, we have live chat. Someone's going to ask you a question live right now. Where are they? Where are they? There they are. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Uh, What's, my your name? What's your question? My name's John. I'm a big fan of comic books, and I was wondering if um... John broke. Can I not? Oh no, John did. John's break. brain broke. Okay. Uh... <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of comic books, and I was wondering, would you ever want to step back into the X-Men movie universe, maybe cross paths with Deadpool, or would you rather step into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Now, should I speak to John that way? No, you can speak out to the camera. You can speak out to the camera. Hi, yeah, John. First of Hi. all, John, uh, we need to get you uh, a painting or something else to put on your wall uh, to balance out that one solitary bookcase. Uh, we're going to send you something courtesy of talking with Chris Hardwick, and you have to put it up on your wall and then send us a picture when you do. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, it, it, obviously, they're both, they're both Marvel properties, but, but he means, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe versus, you know, like, what X-Men did with, like, the Fox. No, I'm pretty sure that my character died in the uh, film that I was in, which means that I probably wouldn't be able to come back as that, but I did have a blast doing those movies. Um, spent most of my time with Ryan Reynolds, actually. We would drive out or get driven out, I should say, to, uh, to set. And he's a very cool, funny guy. And you could tell at the time that his wheels were whirring a little bit with Deadpool. Yeah. That he was like, ah, because he's such a Deadpool fan, he's like, it's not really the Deadpool that I wanted to do, but I'm glad that I'm doing a Deadpool. Right. But I saw Lauren Shula Donna, who's one of the producers of um, X-Men, a few months ago, and she said at the time when she was on set, her and Ryan would be sat around saying, if we were to do another version of Deadpool, we should do it like this, and then years later it became... Doesn't it just look like guys looking at us through a window right there, just like... <laughs> Stop looking at us! I'm John. <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, Deadpool and the, and the Wolverine origin story, it's like, you know how the katanas come out of his arms? How the fuck did he bend his elbows? Those are long blades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every time true. I go, where is that? How is he supposed to bend his... Yeah, it's true, man. By the way, Logan, spectacular. Oh, you saw it? You oh, saw it? Oh, my God. It is I want to go Logan. see it. It's so good. Now we have time for a fan from the, uh, from the audience who's going to come up and ask a question. So come on up. Ask your question. Hello. What's your name? Hi, guys. Oh, I'm Katie. I'm from Hi. Long Beach, California. Nice to see Great. you. Hi, guys. Yeah, Katie. Um, so... It's like I, candy floss or cotton ooh, candy. Oh, thank so you. Nice. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you. You too, Morris. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm a Man U fan, so I was really excited about it. Anyway, so um, I'm wondering, do you ever have girls troll for you that have a hobbit fetish? <laughs> hobbit fetish? And, and wait, this is a two-part question. And if so, have you ever indulged to that? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a really good question. Does anybody, you know, is any girl that like, show me your weird hairy feet? Oh. It. It's been a, it's been a little ruder than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there are some. I try and keep my Twitter feed relatively nice and friendly so that everyone can see it. But there are some people who uh, have approached me for weird things like that. There was a girl who, not gonna mention who she was, but there was a girl who was. How do I put this right? She, um, there was she, a, she asked you to climb her like an ant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, were, there, was a, there was a girl who, it seemed that her ambition was to 
do the fellowship? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yep. Um, yep. Not gonna, not gonna tell you how successful she was. So she was, you're saying she was kind of making her way around she the Shire? She was doing the rounds. She was doing the rounds. Making her way around the Shire. She spent some time in Wellington and she, yeah. she did the rounds. Um, and you were the one who said, you shall not pass. <laughs> Good question. Good question. I actually think, in the, gra in the grand scheme of things, I think Billy Boyd kissed more members of the Fellowship than she did. It's, <laughs> it's a completely different story. Yeah, uh, I have a special thing for you, though. Where is it? Oh, here it is. This is a very, this is very special. Oh, Elvin Clo, you're going to disappear. Because you're, uh, yes. This is for you. There you go. You disappeared. <laughs> Uh, remember, you guys can always be uh, a part of this program here on this show. Uh, just reach out to us on all platforms. At Talking is the handle. Uh, we're going to let you know who our guests are. You can ask them anything. We'll try to incorporate it in the show as best we can. We'll be right back with more Dominic Monaghan on Talking <laughs> Position. We're back. I'm sitting ve very. Rom I feel like this is a first date, and I just keep creeping closer. Like I'm, li I'm liking it. I'm liking what it. What do you? You know, I thought the U-shaped couch would be good because it's sort of like you know, it's a little. But I, but I wonder if it's maybe because you don't know what to do with your legs just, the whole time. I can't. I can't yeah. do that anymore. This. I'm sitting up like a. So tell me about everything. <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know if you. Uh, Don, on Dom's Instagram, there was a Lord of the Rings reunion post. That, mini, a mini one, a mini one. That, oh, of course, they're hobbits. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there they are. So what is happening here? Oh, yeah. not all hobbits. Uh, it's uh, three hobbits, an elf, and a human, right? Yeah. Um, what are you guys doing we, in that hunting lodge? We, <laughs> we went to a place called, is it called Ed, Ed Bergen's on uh, oh, ba, uh, Fair, uh, Fairfax? Ed, ba, Bob Bergen's? Ed, Ed, Bob Bergen's? Maybe. Tom Bergen's. Tom Bergen's. Tom Bergen's, yeah. Uh, we went there because, um, obviously, Vigo was nominated for a, a bunch of uh, movies this year, uh, for a bunch of awards, sorry, for Captain Fantastic. And we had said, you know, we'd like to be around and celebrate that with you if you're into it. So for the Oscars, he was in town, and he said to us, all the kids from Captain Fantastic were so excited that they were working with Aragorn, and they talked a lot about Lord of the Rings, and he said, as a surprise, if you show up at this place, you're going to, you know, freak him out. So we all showed up. And then I'm pr outside of, well, alongside Elijah, I'm probably one of the more active on social media, and I had said, look, we need to document this, because even though we're having fun... We need to show the people who are on social media that we have as much fun being together as those guys want us to be together. Yeah. So we, we did it like that. Oh, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah, and then uh, I, think, I think that was that was on the Saturday. And then on the Sunday, Billy and I went over to Vigo's to watch the most extraordinary Super Bowl of all time. I mean, I'm not that crazy about the Super Bowl, but that was an insane Super Bowl. So. That I heard all about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from my... From all... Good old, mo good old mom swears. I heard all about it. Uh, we have a lot more stuff that we want to give away from people in the audience. So let's have someone come out and ask a question. Get up here and ask your question. Hey, what is your name? I'm Victoria. I'm a huge uh, fan of Victoria? Lost. Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Yeah. Yes. What is your? This is Dom. Nice. Fan of Lost. Hello. What is, Hi, what is your question? My question is actually about the venomous animals that you collect. Yes. Um, yes. Have any ever escaped on you? Um. Yeah, a few have a I think there might be one in my house right now that is unaccounted for. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, I have a large, uh, venomous um, tropical centipede called Scolopendra gigantea, which I put into a, uh, a, a jar, of a, a, a vase, you would call it. Why the fuck would you do that? Uh, well, they, they're usually not able to climb uh, as high as that, but it was quite a big one, and when I went down a couple of days later, it was, <laughs> I was fishing around, and I was like, it's clearly not in there. Um... <laughs> But so that I think is still probably loose in my house, or hopefully will have escaped and gone outside, which is beautiful. It's all part of nature. And then is that a is that a danger? Is that a particularly dangerous? It's venomous. It's venomous. So I mean, a bite from it is it, it won't kill you, but it is extremely painful. It, it like causes necrosis in the area that it bites. So that part of your body is going to necrosis gonna is a bad. You know, necro like that means death. Yeah, like, yeah, that's dead bad. tissue. It will cause pretty pretty bad scarring in that area. And then a friend of mine and his wife, uh, people that come over to my house, kind of know this is you know there's the 
potential of this happening. A friend of mine and his wife were staying at my house, and I said to him, look, there's like a six-foot jet black snake in my house, which I'm pretty sure at this point has left my house, but if you see it, let me know. So... <laughs> And it was big, like the biggest, big, like about Are you as dating big as... anyone? Are they cool with this <laughs> yeah, stuff? They're okay with it. Everyone's all right. So you know, it's about as big as this as this couch. So I was in Brazil, in the Pantanal, the, the kind of open grassland of, of uh, Brazil. And he called me, and he never calls me when I'm on location because he's in the industry as well, and he kind of knows that you know it's it's, it's not going to work. Wait, you're out. talking about the snake? The snake called you? <laughs> yeah, the snake called me. Hey, where are the chips? <laughs> so where so do I... you keep your mice? Yeah, where's all the food? <laughs> I'm starving. So my friend Nigel uh, calls me and says, "Hey, uh, we just open up the trash can to put some trash away, and there's a big black snake in the trash can." What do we do about it? And I said, go upstairs and grab one of my... I have a whole, a whole bunch of terrariums upstairs in my house just in case sure things do. happen. <laughs> so I was like, go upstairs, grab this terrarium, put it inside. He's like, is it, is it dangerous? Is it venomous? I was like, no, it's fine. So he puts it in. I said, did you, did you close the, the, uh, the roof? He said, yeah. And I said, OK, it is venomous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not dangerously venomous, or it's a rear fang no, snake. It's like any even... It's to grab hold of you and bite you for a long time to cause an injury. But the, the, <laughs> the, the good thing about that, the positive thing about that, is that because the snake was rooting around in the trash can, it was getting desperate for food. And I said to Nigel, what you did was probably save that snake's life. Go out and buy a couple of mice in the next couple of days and you'll save its life. And he did, and it was a worthwhile story. So, yeah. Now, I have, a, I have a present for you. This is, this, this is for you uh, oh. right here. This is a drive shaft poster. I, I do want to, just really quick, thank you so much, Victoria. I want to talk, I don't know if you guys have seen, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Wild Things, Dom's show that was, uh, it was it, here we carried on BBC America. And, uh, and the thing that I've always loved about you is you really just do stuff that you're excited about. Like, it doesn't seem to me that, you're even saying, like, well, I, you know, I felt like it was the right time to leave Lost for that character, so I did that. I, I, you know, I love animals, I love insects, I'm going to do a show about it. You know, this, you weren't just a gun for hire on, well, let's just put this actor on this nature show. This was something that was very passionate to you. So when did your love of animals and insects, because and, I have a massive insect collection. They're all in frames. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't <laughs> run around rooting around my trash. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I, I also am a, a huge insect. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an entomologist. I'm an insectophile. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love them. I, I couldn't tell you scientifically everything about them. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same, man. I mean, like, when I hang around with real entomologists, you know, I, I, I don't speak that much. I just listen because it's embarrassing. They all talk Latin and you, you don't know what they're talking about. Uh, but I, I, I'm a huge fan of insects, too. I think the reason why insects became... A big deal for me is because the, the natural world, animals in general, plants, trees, anything that lives, I'm fascinated by. But with insects, you can access them easily in your house, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, sorry, uh, <laughs> in, in your garden, certainly, in your eyelashes. Uh, you know, there's a certain type of mite that lives in everyone's Son eyelashes. Son of a bitch, why would you tell me that? It's true, it's true. There's actually more of them living in female eyelashes because from an oh. evolutionary point of view, they've learned to eat mascara and eyeliner and stuff like that. But they, they live in our eyes. It's very it's You very just important. ruined everyone's day. No, it's, <laughs> it's an important way to keep the bacteria in check, and it stops you from getting conjunctivitis and any kind of bacteria, pink eye and all that kind of stuff. So it's an important animal. So for, so for me, that we, you know, what we've lost over, I don't know how many uh, generations, but what we've, what we've lost is this idea that we are not part of nature, that we're, that we're separate from nature. Right. There's nature and there's humans. We are nature. Humans are part of the nature. Well, not only just that we're separate, but there's this, this sort of idea that we're not just separate from nature, we're on top of nature. Like, we, we feel like we're so top of everything all the time that we're these apex creatures. Yeah, it's sickening, man. And we're, we're not apex creatures just because we invented a computer and went to the moon. That is impressive in a lot of ways. And we can put money in our pocket and that, you know, gets us away from having to go and hunt for food and need shelter and stuff like that. But there are creatures in the jungle that can hunt silently without opening their eyes just by using their sense of smell. If you put us in the jungle naked, we're dead in 72 hours. Right. These creatures can do profound things, superpowers that they have. And we need to be a little bit more respectful of those animals because not only are they impressive, but they're keeping us alive. How many times have you almost died uh, running around the planet? Um, I don't think, I'm not sure you ever really know how close you get to death unless you have those moments. I mean, we were chased by an elephant, which was certainly a, a you know, uh, kind of near-death experience. Maybe it was uh, just a fan of Lord of the Rings, won an autograph. <laughs> yeah. Come come back! <laughs> Send my trunk! Well, what, what was great about that was that my herpetologist, Donald Schultz, who travels with us because when we work with venomous creatures, he and I get together and talk about how we're going to work with this particular... That's a snake scientist. Animal. Yes. Well done. Thank you. 
he was the person you see in the footage. He's the person that actually turns round and runs towards the elephant to stop it killing my cameraman. And and we were all very very appreciative of what he did. And when we were talking about it later, he said, "Well, oh, man, I missed a trick." And I said, "What?" He said, "I should have said." You shall not. <laughs> That's what he should have said that. That's what he should have said that. That's the moment. Yeah, that would have broken the elephant's brain. Right? Uh, we have uh, time for a couple more questions. We have someone else from the audience going to come up and ask a question. Yes, you, sir. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Chris. What hey, is your Dominic? name? My name is Dante. Welcome, Dante. What's so your Dante, question? Dante, cool name, cool my, name. Well, thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, my question is, if you could make a spinoff Lord of the Rings movie about Mary... What would your Mary's solo movie be about? Oh, this is a good one. You know, one of the things that we talked about when we were making the film, and one of the things that we, we kept asking Pete about, and unfortunately we didn't have the time or the money or, you know, uh, it just wasn't part of the script, was there's, there's a chapter in the books called The Scouring of the Shire. And what happens is, a after uh, the ring is... Sorry to ruin it. After the ring has been destroyed... Uh, <laughs> You've had a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, no spoiler, you can't complain. Someone on Twitter is going to start screaming yeah. at me tonight. I'm Come on! What the fuck? Jesus. So after that happens, the hobbits head back to the Shire as slight warrior-type characters. They're certainly the toughest guys in the Shire. <clears throat> and Saruman, Christopher Lee's character, is now in the Shire, and he's taken over, and he's, and he's it's, you know, completely degraded, and all the, all the creatures and all the animals and, and the plant life is all gone. So we run him out of the Shire in a very military operation. And we had said to Pete... We've earned this right now. We're in armor and we have swords to do this. And, you know, Pete just said, look, there's certain things that we can and can't do. And there's so many endings in that trilogy and we just couldn't do another one. So I, I, would, I would want to see Mary as a warrior, you know. Awesome. Thank you, Dante. Cool Thank question. You. Yeah, just some other Lord of the Rings questions. Uh, American Node on uh, Twitter says, Dominic, have you gone back to New Zealand since the end of Lord of the Rings? Oh, man, I've been back to New Zealand a bunch. I probably, since Lord of the Rings, been back five or six times. I did an episode of Wild Things there looking yeah. for the largest uh, cricket in the world, this thing called a wetter, massive grasshopper-type-looking creature. Um, been back to... Yeah, glowworms in the, in the <laughs> caves. Uh, been back to see Pete. We did... Uh, I, I was there when they were... Um, Shooting The Hobbit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I see those guys quite a lot. I'm still trying to buy property there, so I have people, like, looking for a place for me in Wellington. Uh, well, uh, I feel like there's one place you could probably uh, oh, yeah. just move into. It's a tiny little house. You have... I mean, is it hard to buy property there in New Zealand, or you just haven't found the right place just yet? Just haven't found the right place. Gotcha, it's gotcha, not, gotcha. It's not hard to find a place there. When, when Billy and I went back to the place that, uh, you know, looks like the Shire and has the Prancing Pony and, and has all these, like, you know, tourists walking through and stuff... We served a bunch of uh, Korean tourists behind the bar, and they were utterly dumbfounded. <laughs> it's what? amazing there. They actually serve you. Yeah. We're like, what are you doing here? We're like, we have a place up above. <laughs> hang out. This is where we live. And they, they couldn't work it out. Uh, let's see. Let's get a good one here. Okay. Uh, Luke Witt, 91, says, uh, best Lord of the Rings moment behind the scenes. Oh, man. I mean, it's like almost two years of our lives. Um, best moment. I remember, like, my... What did I celebrate there? My 22nd birthday, I think. I was DJing in a, in a bar in uh, Wellington called The Maton with Elijah. We were, like, swapping records and stuff. And Vigo came in with the stunt guys. He hung out with the stunt guys a lot, which, as you can imagine, is a very burly crew. Sure. 10, 15 big Maori guys. And uh, they said, oh, Vigo's coming in with a bunch of people. Can you, like, usher him in and show, you, show him where the party is? And I said, yeah. And Vigo came in, and he was about 10 feet away from me. And I was like, hey, V, come this way. And he ran towards me and headbutted me so hard that I almost, like, lost consciousness. <laughs> and then him and the stunt guys jumped on top of me. So there's, like, 15 massive dudes. And the security guy in the bar had no idea what was going on. <laughs> we eventually stood up. We're like, no, sorry, it's, it's my birthday, and we're just, you know, having fun and stuff. So Vigo Mortensen headbutts you for your birthday? It's like a celebratory thing that he used to do with the stunt guys that he brought into the rest of the gang. Now, did you make it clear to him that you were not a stunt guy? Yeah. Okay. And in, in comparison to myself and Vig, he's a good foot taller than me, you know. But it's just a, it's just a way of, you know, showing love at the time. Sure. And it sticks in my mind because, you know, we were a few tequilas deep and it turned into a great night and we were playing music and everyone was there. So I think my 22nd birthday was a big one. I mean, that, that you know, I think, I don't know if people really understand, like, how much time you guys genuinely spent together. I mean, that is... 
as mu- that is an, an av- like you know someone might have a job for a couple of years and yeah. feel like that was a significant that was a significant part of your life. Yeah, it was principal photography was almost two years. I think it was you know a couple of months shy of two years. And then when I said bye to Pete at the end of principal photography, he just laughed and said, "Don't worry, we'll see you next year." And I said, "You will you see you next year?" And he said, well, "We're going to bring you back, I'm sure, for reshoots." And we would come back for between six to eight to ten weeks of reshoots each year for three years. Oh my god! And that's like making, as you know, that's like making three, two or three movies in yeah. those in those ten weeks. You know, so we came back, and then we did this insane press run at the, uh, in the Christmas period when the films came out. So it was funny because Pete could see the long game. So when we were all crying at the rap party, he's like, "Oh, we had so much fun. We'll never see you again." He's like. We're going to hang out for the next decade. <laughs> Don't worry about you it. You will not be able to wait to get yeah. this all yeah, over true. with. Yeah. That was great. We were, I went to uh, Japan with Pete to, to promote, I think it was Two Towers, myself, Elijah, Pete, Liv Tyler. And Pete's a huge Beatles fan. And the only way that you can get Pete to do anything is to, is to kind of get him, you know, interested in the Beatles. And I'm a massive Beatles fan too. And there was a Beatles bar where Japanese people would sing Beatles songs. And it's the only time we've managed to get Peter Jackson out. He came out, we had a few drinks, we took photos together. And again, it's one of those moments that sticks in your head because he's, he's quite shy and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't really do a huge amount. Pete, he's got yeah. a family and a wife, obviously. But I remember we were at dinner and I just said, we're going to go to this Japanese bar where they play Beatles songs. And he was like, I'm in, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so if you want to trap Peter Jackson, that's the way to do it. Sure. <laughs> Pete, it's Paul McCartney. Do you want to come out and play? <laughs> Right there. <laughs> we were at, um, we were at, we were at the Vanity Fair party. We were lucky enough to get invited to the Vanity Fair party for Return of the King, and I was there with Elijah and Pete, and we we're talking about something. And someone came over to Peter Jackson and said, uh, "Paul McCartney's coming in. He'd like to see you." <laughs> and Pete just turned around to me because he knew, knew how much that was a big to both of us, myself and Elijah. He went, oh, "Paul McCartney," and I said, "I can't. I gotta go, man. I can't meet him. I can't do that." Like, I was too scared that like. That whatever, what are you going to say to Paul McCartney? We had him on the podcast. I had him on the podcast. It's just like, you know, oh, I love your music. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> and what if he says, whatever, and then Beatles music's ruined for the rest of your life? Like, I just, <laughs> so I ran off. He, he met Elijah and Pete, and, and they chatted, and I just said, I, I can't do it. It's too, it's too precious to me. I'll tell you about, you know, we... Uh, well, you know, we can probably cut this out of the show, because this does. this is about me and not you, but... Uh, Let's talk about well, you. Well, OK, so, we had, so we, had, we had... Paul McCartney agreed to come on the podcast, came on a couple years ago. And uh, he just couldn't have been nicer. And and I, was I going Chris. and he really was. He really was. We went to his office in New York. You know, you know what's really, you know what's really funny is that uh, sometimes people come on the podcast and they'll bring a big posse, and it's like, oh, you're like the third lead on a thing, and right, you've right. got like nine people. Paul McCartney. We just went into his office alone. Nice. Um, talked to him, and and I guess I kind of realized like. You know, how many people really just talk to him like a dude? How many yeah, people yeah. just talk to him like a person? So we just talk to him like yeah. a guy. And, you and know, that's he, all he wants. And that's all he wants. You know, he really wants to be a part of the human experience. As much as you want to be a part of the Beatles experience, he wants to be a part of the human experience. And so, you know, he's like, people want to take pictures all the time. And I'm like, can't we just have a conversation? Yeah, that's a you know, can point. we just talk and ride to the subway? Like, he's very, he's a very sweet guy and really just, you know, there, there, there's very few of that really exists anymore. Yeah, like, yeah. He's, so, he's such a unique entity, but just like a totally normal guy. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, he is, he's, he's one of those living legends, and it's tough for him to get out of the way of that because of the, the things that he's done in his life. But like you said, he is, he is just a human being. I mean, I have all these, you know, kind of rare uh, radio shows that Lennon did, and coming towards the end of his life, he was obsessed with being just a person. He keeps saying, I'm not a guru. I don't know. I d- I'm just saying things. I don't know if it's true or real or not. I'm yeah. just talking. People put microphones in. Well, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility. And also for Paul, I was kind of digging around and going, oh, well, he, he referred to the, perform- the, the Beatle as that guy. All right. He was like, you know, I, like, I, know when I, I know when I have to be that guy, right. but at home I'm not that guy. Yeah. And he even said up until recently, and, you know, he's in his 70s, that he kind of had that imposter syndrome where he thought someone was going to tap him on the shoulder and be like, uh, you don't know what you're doing. He's going to be like, oh, shit, I guess I don't, you know. <laughs> uh, do you ever feel that? Do you, do you, do you ever get the... Uh, I, I feel like you're well-adjusted. I don't feel like you suffer from any, like, well, oh, is, there, is anyone going to like me or not? You just kind of... You I'm, seem pretty, pretty relaxed. I mean, I'm, adjust, I'm adjusted as well as I can be. I was brought up by a teacher father and a mother nurse, so I'm not in this business at all. I, I am aware of turning it on at times, sure. having, having to turn it on at times. And, you know, my, my friend, my best friend who I've known since I was nine, says that, you know, we went to Manchester United a, a few months ago to see 
uh, a game and, and Beckham was there and we were in this section with, with a few famous people and he said... You, know, you mean I'm... Victoria Beckham from the Spice Girls? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lovely legs. Um, and he, he said, he knows me well enough now that he, he said, I, I can see that switch where we were, in, we were in the bar having a drink and nothing was going on and then we came out into the, into the stadium and he said, I can see that switch in you where you know you have to, like, turn it on. And it, it just becomes, as you know, it becomes part of your life a little bit. But... You know, at home, we, I do the same thing that everyone else does. I watch movies. I listen. play video games. Like, we, uh, we would text each other and say, what are you playing? What are you playing? What are you yeah, playing? Was, oh, the Bioshock. Bioshock yeah. Infinite. Bi- yeah, one of the Bioshock. greatest games, yeah. in my opinion, of all time. The, sli- the slidey thing was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hook and the, you're yeah. going through the... Yeah, that game, that game is epic. Uh, for me, Skyrim's the biggest deal for me. I played that game for a year and a half to the point where I was literally fucking just getting cabbages and putting them in my houses because I ran out of quests. Oh, no shit. Did you take it all the way? Uh, yeah, no, I... I don't think I took it all the way. I don't think I got to level 100. I think I got to, like, level... I mean, I'm still playing now. Right. Level 87 or something like that. Yeah, wait, that's cute. Wait, 87's you... cute. <laughs> I mean, if you know. It's adorable. Where you can, you can, like, smoke most people. But wait, yeah. so you got to that level where... Because when you get to a level 100, you can then take all your points away and go from legendary, right? That's I, you know, what I, what I just did was uh, I, I, had, I had homes in every hold, yeah, yeah. and but there was nothing left for me to do. Like, I, you can go through and, re, and you know, like, go through caves again and clear out, like, right. draugers and stuff like that. But, but at a certain point, there was literally nothing left for me to do, and I, w- I would just go get cabbages and fill them up in baskets, and I adopted a couple kids, and I'd go, and I'd... <laughs> Like, you'd run in, and they'd run up to you, and you'd be like, I'm not, I don't know why. I got nothing yeah, for I got you. nothing for you. I can't yeah. do anything. The grinding thing gets a little annoying. I, I, would, I would get really excited coming home from location or, or thinking, okay, I've got nothing going on on Sunday. I'm going to play Skyrim. And then you realize once you start playing it, oh, I have, like, two hours of grinding to do before I can do the thing that I Before you can actually, do. yeah. And that's, that's what's really hard is that the more my schedule gets uh, tighter... My favorite games are RPGs, and uh, they just, you know, take, yeah. take 40, 50, 60 hours, yeah. and you can't just play for, like, a half hour. <laughs> I, I, like, I like immersive worlds, and I'm playing The Last Guardian right now. Uh-huh. Have you seen that? It's absolutely stunning where, you know, I'm such a huge fan of, of creatures. You, you wake up in a, in a cave where there's a, like, griffin dragon-type creature that's in there with you, and then you adopt this slightly unnerving relationship with it where you're helping it out, it's helping you out, but it can kill you. And then sure. sooner or later, it becomes like a puppy dog, and it's, it's beautifully drawn, Japanese, I think. Um, but, yeah, I like... If I'm going to play a video game now, just like you, I don't have a huge amount of time, I want to turn it on, and within a couple of minutes, I'm in the world. I don't yeah. want to, like, spend so much time in menus or, you know, all, all kind of, like, admin stuff. I want to get in there. Final Fantasy has a really good mobile <laughs> game called Brave Exvius, which was, which was not retrofitted for mobile. It was designed specifically for mobile, and it's really good, and they update content all the time. So that's easy because I'm on the go. But we got a VR rig uh, for the, the PS4, and we've been, I, we were playing... Um, Resident Evil, oh. and uh, it's great, but I, you know, the VR, I can play for like 15 minutes, and then I, and then I, I feel like I'm going to throw up. Like yeah, yeah. Mo- it, it gets, I get too motiony. Can you, I, can you do VR? I've done VR. I think they're eventually going to get it to a place where it doesn't feel quite as, as strange. But I, I, there's some games that I can't quite do. Like when I first came to LA with Elijah and stayed at Elijah's place, he was playing Silent Hill, and mm-hmm. it gave me the creeps. Yeah, man. it really creeped me out. And Elijah was, Elijah loves horror, and he knows a lot about horror. And he was really into it, but the, 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 the filthiness of Silent Hill and the fact that there'll be a good five or ten minutes where nothing happens and then you'll turn a corner and there's this dead thing just running at you. I couldn't... Well, imagine that, but in VR, where, it, where your senses tell yeah. you, like, you are being chased by a thing that is behind you. Mm. I mean, it's, it's horrifying. For me, I think, the, the, at least for me, I, I'm a huge sports fan, the future of VR for me is going to be sports where I can't play with Lionel Messi, I can't play with Cristiano Ronaldo, but in the future, in... FIFA, hopefully I can jump in there and ask for the ball from a football player. That's, that's something that I'm really excited about. You never know. Get an alley-oop from LeBron. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Um, let's take one more fan question from the audience. Let's take one more fan question. Do we have a... Yes, you, sir. Hello. Ah, hello. A sharp, divested young man oh, steps sorry. forth. Ask your question of Dominic right, Monaghan. I'm uh, Sam from Los Angeles. Hey, Sam. Sam. I wanted to ask you, uh, has there ever been a prop that you've stolen from a, a set that you've kept as a moment? Borrowed, 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 borrowed. borrowed, borrowed. borrowed. Infinitely borrowed. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll always attempt to take something, because uh, I'm going to steal that snake. You can have the snake. Um, I'll give you the snake right oh, now. Oh, Chris! Have... There you go. Wait, wait. 
Oh my God, will you make me the happiest? Will you make me the happiest? My wife will be cool with it. Thanks, Chris. Yo, baby, I got snake engaged at Dominic Monaghan. Is that cool? <laughs> That's the cutest. Um, I, have, I have snakes at home, so I'm going to put that in the... In What'd the you say? Thing. What'd you say, Jim, Brendan? Okay. Can you ask your question one more time just because they can cover it again? Okay. Okay. What I want to know is, has there ever been a prop from a set that you've stolen to keep as a memento? Um, stolen's a dodgy word. Could you yeah. get borrowed. Into borrowed, 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 um, borrowed. We, Peter Jackson was very gracious about giving us certain things on the movie and knowing how important it was for us as well as him. So uh, we all got our final clapper board on Lord of the Rings, the final time that they, that they put the board on. Oh, that's Yeah, nice. it was cool. And we also got either a piece of armour or a weapon that made sense for us. So obviously, Orly got his bow, uh, which, interestingly, he snapped in his very last take. Hadn't done it for two years, and his last day he had to jump off this, like, platform, and he snapped. And I was like, it's over, dude. Like, that's, <laughs> that's how it goes. And I got my sword from Rohan, and I think Billy got his sword, Elijah got the ring. Um, I got some ears, I got some feet. And then, oh, you got the feet? I got some Are feet. Are they full feet, like, shoes? Do they wear, like, shoes? Do they go on top of your feet? Yeah, and I don't take them out that much because uh, Richard Taylor said they'll start to degrade in air, so you have to put talcum powder on them and don't expose them to air that much. Sure. But they're, they're, they're up to about here, and then they would, like, you know, kind of blend them in, you know? Might have gone a little hard now with the, with the air, you know? Sure. And then, um, <coughs> what else? I have my hoodie from Lost. Um, I have the Drive Chef ring from Lost. When I... When I was on Wolverine, it's funny, because um, the cats that I play on Wolverine could control electricity. So you have all these little clockwork kind of uh, toys in his house that when he, you know, makes his mind work, they all start worrying. And I asked for a few of those, and I have them. And they're scattered around my house. A lot of my friends say, what are these janky little crap? <laughs> you know, like penny kind of toys, yeah, like, yeah. you know, quarter toys. And I'm like, no, no, it's from a movie. So I will take it. One of the things I do, which is really funny, is I'll... If it's a movie that meant a lot to me or a TV show, I'll frame my first call sheet of the, of yeah. the shoot and then the last call sheet. And I have that for Lord of the Rings. So it's like, you know, the first one and then like two and a half years later, the last one. Cause it was Did some... you hear what happened with the audience just now? Oh. They were like, I didn't think you could get any more fuckable, but oh, <laughs> so adorable. So adorable. Thank you, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, so, uh, you know, as, as we're kind of wrapping this up and now you have this, this snake uh, to take home, um, do you have any kind of parting wisdom or advice for, uh, as someone who I said seems well-adjusted, seems to only pursue stuff that you're very passionate about, you know, what do you say to people? Like, how do you find what you're passionate about? How do you pursue what you're passionate about? Like, what are some, what are some parting words of wisdom that you can give to people? Oh, man, I don't know about wisdom. I'm still trying to work it out myself. I think you always are, and hopefully yeah, yeah. you always feel like you're a student of life. But, but, but to, at this point, what would you say? Yeah, um, I mean, the things that have served me over the years and seem to continue to do the same, and anytime I have the opportunity to talk to young people, or college students or university people, I always say do you know what you're intending on doing? Do you know what you, you're thinking about doing, you know, as a career? And the people that say yes, I say, that's fantastic, go for it. And the people that say, I'm not sure yet, I say, so this is the question to meditate on. This is the question to spend some time on, is to sit in those, in those times where you have the opportunity to think and meditate on what do I want to do? Because I think one of the luckiest gifts you can give to yourself is to know what you've decided to be your purpose at a young age. I mean, if it happens midway through your life, that's great too. Or, or at the end of your life, that's fantastic as well. But if you can do it when you're young, it means you get a jump on that career. So I always tell people to try and think about that being the most important question. And then from there, I'm a big uh, believer in intention, which is one of the major reasons I think that I've been able to navigate into things that I want to do. Think about that thing that you want to do in the future and then spend a lot of time creating that picture of the life that you're going to walk into. This is something that JJ and I talked about a lot. Um, you know, I admire JJ and what he's achieved in his life. And, you know, when I, was a, when I was a younger man, I would say, you know, how did you do these things and how do you have this ability to do that stuff? And JJ would say to me, look, I project into my future the things that I want to happen and I imagine myself walking into that life. And that's kind of served me well. And the greater detail you can picture it, the yes. better it serves you. Yes. What I understand. And there's a, there's a lot of tricks, if you will, uh, that you can do that, that kind of appear to be a little pretentious or a little over the top where, 
You can write down your goals and, you know, laminate them and put them in your shower or put them on your front door. Or I, I put post-it notes sometimes on my uh, little, not the rearview mirror, but the little, what, vanity mirror? Is that what you call that? In the, the, yeah, in the little, yeah, the yeah. little foot down. Yeah. I'll put things on that sometimes. And I also, look, I'm doing it right now. Hang on. I'm wearing, hang on, where is it? Find escaped centipede. <laughs> 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 See this thing here? I'm wearing an elastic band. Now, this band that I wear allows me to get out of any headspace that I don't think is worthwhile. So if I'm thinking about something that I think is not uh, valuable in my life, I'll snap this, and it'll send a message to my brain, don't do that. That is fucking genius. I've never thought to do that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it just... It just... It, it, it's, a, it's a trick, if you will, because if, you, if your brain starts to associate things with even an annoyance, which it doesn't hurt, it's an annoyance, if your brain starts to associate with that, it will try and veer away from that eventually. And also, it's just that thing of when you lose your train of thought. You can be so focused on something and someone goes, hey, Dom, what? Oh, shit, I forgot what I was... Yeah, and, yeah. and if that's a negative thing, then that's a great way to get out of it. That is one of the best pieces of advice I, I've ever heard. Sweet, dude. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you all for being here and enjoying this fan journey down the pathway we call Dominic Monaghan. Check out Dominic's new show. Uh, I'm sorry, check out Dom's new movie, Atomica. Uh, and let us know what you think of the show. We're at Talking on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, probably even uh, Friendster and MySpace, you guys. We'll put you in our top eight. Um, uh, you guys are also a big part of the show. Always check with us because no matter who we're talking to or what we're talking about, we always want to hear from you. So thank you so much. Huge hand for Dom. Uh, at Dom's Wild Things on Twitter. Uh, follow him. Learn from him. Enjoy his work. Uh, thank you so much again. I'm Chris Hardwick. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Say this time on Talking with Chris Hardwick. Thanks. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. Son of a bitch, why would you tell me that? It's true, it's true. There's actually more of them living in female eyelashes because from an oh. evolutionary point of view, they've learned to eat mascara and eyeliner and stuff like that. But they, they live in our eyelashes. It's very, it's you very just important. ruined everyone's day. No, it's, <laughs> it's an important way to keep the bacteria in check and it stops you from getting conjunctivitis and any kind of bacteria, pink eye and all that kind of stuff. So it's an important animal. So for, so for me, that... We, you know, what we've lost over, I don't know how many uh, generations, but what we've, what we've lost is this idea that we are not part of nature, that we're, that we're separate from nature. Right. There's nature and there's humans. We are nature. Humans are part of the nature. Well, not only just that we're separate, but there's this, this sort of idea that we're not just separate from nature, we're on top of nature. Like, we, we feel like we're so top of everything all the time that we're these apex creatures. Yeah, it's sickening, man. And we're, we're not apex creatures just because we invented a computer and went to the moon. That is impressive in a lot of ways. And we can put money in our pocket and that, you know, gets us away from having to go and hunt for food and need shelter and stuff like that. But there are creatures in the jungle that can hunt silently, without opening their eyes, just by using their sense of smell. If you put us in the jungle naked, we're dead in 72 hours. Right. These creatures can do profound things, superpowers that they have. And we need to be a little bit more respectful of those animals because not only are they impressive, but they're keeping us alive. How many times have you almost died uh, running around the planet? Um, I don't think, I'm not sure you ever really know how close you get to death unless you have those moments. I mean, we were chased by an elephant, which was certainly a, a you know, uh, kind of near-death experience. Maybe it was uh, just a fan of Lord of the Rings. I want an autograph. <laughs> yeah. Dom, come back! <laughs> Send my trunk! Well, what, what was great about that was that my herpetologist, Donald Schultz, who travels with us because when we work with venomous creatures, he and I get together and talk about how we're going to work with this particular... That's a snake scientist. Animal. Yes. Well done. Thank you. He was the person you see in the footage. He's the person that actually turns round and runs towards the elephant to stop it killing my cameraman. And, and we were all very, very appreciative of what he did. And when we were talking about it later, he said, well, man, I missed a trick. I said, what? He said, I should have said... You shall not. <laughs> That's what he should have said that. That's what he should have said that. That's the moment. Yeah, that would have broken the elephant's brain. Right. Uh, we have uh, time for a couple more questions. We have someone else from the audience going to come up and ask a question. Yes, you, sir. 
Hello. Hey, Chris. What hey, is your Dominic. name? My name is Dante. Welcome, Dante. What's so your Dante, question? Cool name. Cool my, name. Well, thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, my question is, if you could make a spinoff Lord of the Rings movie about Mary, what would your Mary solo movie be about? Oh, this is a good one. You know, one of the things that we talked about when we were making the film, and one of the things that we, we kept asking Pete about, and unfortunately we didn't have the time or the money or, you know, uh, it just wasn't part of the script, was there's, there's a chapter in the books called The Scouring of the Shire. And what happens is, a after uh, the ring is... There might be one in my house right now that is unaccounted for. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, I have a large, uh, venomous, um, tropical centipede called Scolopendra gigantea, which I put into a, uh, a, a jar, of a, a, a vase, you would call it. Why the fuck would you do that? Uh, well, they, they're usually not able to climb uh, as high as that, but it was quite a big one, and when I went down a couple of days later, it was, <laughs> I was fishing around, and I was like, it's clearly not in there. Um, um, but so that, I think, is still probably loose in my house or hopefully will have escaped and gone outside, which is beautiful. It's all part of nature. And then... Is that a, is that a, danger, is that a particularly dangerous... It's venomous. It's venomous. So, I mean, a bite from it is... It, it won't kill you, but it is extremely painful. It, it like, causes necrosis in the area that it bites, so that part of your body is going to Necrosis gonna is a bad... You know, necro, like, that means death. Yeah, like, yeah. That's not, dead tissue. It will cause pretty, pretty bad scarring in that area. And then a friend of mine and his wife... Uh, people that come over to my house kind of know this is... You know, there's the potential of this happening. A friend of mine and his wife were staying at my house, and I said to him, look, there's, like, a six-foot jet black snake in my house, which I'm pretty sure at this point has left my house, but if you see it, let me know. So... <laughs> And it was big, like the biggest, big, like about. Are you as dating as... anyone? Are they cool with this yeah, stuff? Yeah, they're okay with it. Everyone's all right. So you know, it's about what? as big as this, as this couch. So I was in Brazil, in the Pantanal, the, the kind of open grassland of, of uh, Brazil, and he called me, and he never calls me when I'm on location because he's in the industry as well, and he kind of knows that you know it's it's, it's not going to work. Wait, you're talking about the snake? The snake called you? <laughs> yeah, the snake called me. Hey, where are the chips? <laughs> so where so do I... you keep your mice? Yeah, where's all the food? <laughs> I'm starving. <laughs> So my friend Nigel uh, calls me and says, hey, uh, we just opened up the trash can to put some trash away, and there's a big black snake in the trash can. What do we do about it? And I said, go upstairs and grab one of my... I have a whole bunch of terrariums upstairs in my house just in case sure these things happen. <laughs> so I was like, go upstairs, grab this terrarium, put it inside. He's like, is it, is it dangerous? Is it venomous? I was like, no, it's fine. So he puts it in. I said, did you, did you close the, the, uh, the roof? He said, yeah. And I said, OK, it is venomous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not dangerously venomous, it's a rear fang no, snake. Like any even it needs to grab hold of you and bite you for a long time to cause an injury. But the, the, <laughs> the, the good thing about that, the positive thing about that, is that because the snake was rooting around in the trash can, it was getting desperate for food. And I said to Nigel, what you did was probably save that snake's life. Go out and buy a couple of mice in the next couple of days and you'll save its life. And he did. And it was a worthwhile story. So now yeah. I have a I have a present for you. This is this, this is for you uh, wow. right here. This is a drive shaft poster. I, I do want to just really quick. Thank you so much, Victoria. I want to talk. I don't know if you guys have seen. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Wild Things, Dom's show that was uh, was here. We carried on BBC America and. Uh, and the thing that I've always loved about you is you really just do stuff that you're excited about. Like, it doesn't seem to me that you're even saying, like, well, I, you know, I felt like it was the right time to... The, the, the fandom of it has changed over years. I remember going to New Zealand and seeing Pete Jackson, and one of the first things he said to me within, like, 20 minutes, said, are you watching Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, hardcore, Pete. Like, not well, seeing him for a couple of years, and that was his question. I do want to I do want to get to some Lord of the Rings stuff uh, later in the show, but I, I, I want to talk about Atomica. First of all, I want to tell you that Pet is one of the most disturbing films I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, you guys should watch it. I really like that film. It's great. You, you'll watch the trailer... And you'll think it's one kind of movie, but it is not that kind of movie at all. It, it completely surprises you. But you play such a delightful fucking creep in that movie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching it. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I was talking with, with a friend of mine uh, last week, and they said, you know, is there a movie that you've done that there's a chance that I might have seen? I said, there's quite a lot of movies. There. <laughs> but he said, well, what, what's something that I should hunt out and find? And, and I said, you should watch Pet, because... Um, Pet came about in between seasons one and two of Lost. Uh, Jeremy Slater, who wrote uh, Fantastic Four and, and the recent Exorcist uh, TV show, uh, they sent this script and they said, oh, he wrote it for you. And I didn't really believe that he wrote it for me at the time. And then I met him in L.A. and he said, no, I, I did write it for you based on watching you go in and out of these darker moments with Charlie in season one of Lost. And um, we were going to do it in between seasons one and two, but there was a writer's strike. Right, writer's I remember strike? that, yeah. 
And at the time, I think Melissa George was supposed to play Holly. And then when we came back around after the writer's strike, Melissa George couldn't do it because I think she was going to have a baby. And then we were looking for Holly and it got put on the shelf. And, like, ten years went by. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And I was uh, doing this, um, this video game last year... I can't remember the name of. I don't remember the name of that, that video. Super Mario <laughs> Pac-Man. Some Xbox game. I think that's embarrassing. I can't remember Xbox Pac-Man. Probably. Um, and um, I'm not going to remember it. And uh, they called me and said, oh, Pet's up and running again. And I said, well, I'm, I'm ten years older. So I met the director and said, wouldn't it be... It's almost like the same story that I had with uh, JJ about Charlie. I said, wouldn't it be even more tragic if this guy who's supposed to be in his mid-20s and is sad and has no friends and has a bad relationship with his family and never had a girlfriend, what if he was in his mid-30s and all those things were true? And the director said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So then we filmed it in... I'm glad it was now, because I think it just made... It just made so, when you see the movie, it'll all make sense to you. And again, stick with it, because you'll think it's one kind of movie and you really need to see how it... Yeah, how it plays out because yeah. it's real uncomfortable in the beginning. Yeah, where you're like, I'm supposed to. This is supposed to be the protagonist. Yeah, you know, well, it's, it says underneath a love story, and you just think, okay, this is going to be creepy guy meets girl, and he's going to be a, 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 like treating a poorly, and that's kind of the movie. But like Chris said, it's not. We would we would watch it at these screenings, and we'd, I'd seen it so many times that I would jump out and get food or, or go get a cup of tea or something, and I'd come in for that. You have the back. You have the seat that you sit on, yes, right? Yes, that's how that works. And then you've got the spinal thing that I kind do, of makes yep. things straight. And yes. then the cushion... You don't like the cushion puts for lumbar support? ...puts a in your spine. Well, you don't have to sit like... Gu- you don't have to sit like Gumby. Like I you... just... I don't understand. I, I don't I understand the function. It's, a, it's for lumbar support. If you have maybe a, a hot... Uh, bowl of soup. And you then you can put it over your lap, like you know, or if you have a laptop to protect in terms your... Of the lap thing, every time they do it on a plane, you know, when they give you a cushion, I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. You don't can want I, that cushion? Just... Hey, just, 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 just fuck the cushion. Yeah, get out of here. Mine's hiding a backup microphone in case our mics die, and it's hiding my phone, uh, which I, if I don't have it within proximity of me, I, my brain melts. I'm having, like, in the past couple of years, so major problems with my phone in terms of my connection to it and the way that I feel about it. You mean, like, like too much of an addiction? <sighs> yeah, I just, I, I, I'm start, I've, I've been having some anxiety with the fact that I can't seem to get myself away from my phone in terms of the life that I have and the career that I have. And I've said for a long time now, I want to not have a cell phone. And obviously, my agent says, that's ridiculous. <laughs> my mum and dad are like, oh, that's fine, do it. But my agent's like, you can't not have a cell phone. And I said, well, you know, not that I'm Bill Murray, but, you know, Bill Murray has an answer machine and not an agent, supposedly, and people just call him. I feel like Bill machine. Murray has, like, a carrier pigeon that just <laughs> finds him wherever he is, and then he gets a thing, and then he just shows up, yeah. like, at a bar mitzvah or something. But you know those things where you, you, you say those comments, and then eventually you have to get to a point where you say, I can't keep just saying this, I have to... You actually have to do it, yeah. And and I'm not... I think generations underneath us obviously have major problems with not being able to get away from their phone. And I'm not completely impossible, but it it makes me feel anxious. And from a physical point of view, I have problems with the end of my index finger, the end of my middle finger, and a little section of my hand. Oh, poor little monkey, you okay? Is your hand okay? No, but I'm serious. It's... it's, See that little dark section there? (laughs) This is, by the way, this for a man, this is a severe injury. You have to understand. We have low pain you see that thresholds. On Look, it's, it's like, all. Yeah, I know. But honestly, this is, this is not like. <laughs> but no, but it's it's not the weight of the phone. Yeah, I but feel you're just like a little... the badness of the of the mobile phone. It's and getting into your phone. It's going in the radiation, the, the evilness think... of it. I mean, th- there there's no question that there is that, that we uh, have an addiction. That there is a tremendous social media addiction. Mm. I, I mean, I. It feels weird when you don't have it near you and you just feel like, well, I'm disconnected from everything that's going on. Yeah. But if you spent, you know, if you'd really lost your phone and you lived away somewhere for a few days, you would readjust. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. Like, I, I go to Peru usually for about three weeks at the end of the year and there's no cell phones that work there. And for the first day or two, that my friends that I'm with, because I'm a little bit more used to it now, my friends that I'm with are, are, are anxious about, you know, doing this and stuff. And I say, what? Well, People can hide behind that little, you know, bird egg twittery. It's it's uh, it's legitimately weaponized anonymity, and I think people forget, you know, because they. I think sometimes people bundle free speech in with anonymous free speech, and I sort of feel like free speech is a right that we have. Being anonymous is a privilege. Yeah. And I think people weaponize that privilege, 
And and then it, to some, it feels like it's the most cowardly of all acts. So you're going to go after someone and they don't know who you are and you're going to get away with it? Where's the... Yeah, I mean, the Leslie Jones stuff was just disgusting. It was actually. abysmal. And, yeah. and, I mean, for you, it must be worse because you in some way kind of represent that Twitter thing and the... It's not that... I mean, listen, I, I, I whine about it. <laughs> you were, though. I, I, whine, I whine about it to my wife sometimes and, and, and you know, she's like, what are you doing? Because it really isn't... Um, I don't get it that bad. You know, people just go, you, your fucking face is dumb. And I'll go, aw. And uh, or they'll but, go. But you do get a lot of traffic. And you I have do a lot get a lot of, of traffic. And so as your traffic goes up, your percentage of trolling goes up. And sure. some people just want to fuck with you. And that's the way it is. And, you know, but if that's the worst of it, I mean, people, you know, I, I feel like, like in, like in Leslie's case, for instance, like, I, I don't, I've never experienced that level of yeah. disrespect and vitriol. And so, you know, for me mm. to say, like, you know, when on Walking Dead, when, ne when they didn't find out who Negan killed at the end of season six, that was as much toxicity as I've ever felt from the Internet before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People were very upset. They thought that I had something to do with that in some way. Uh, I realized I was Walking Dead customer service at that point. <laughs> but, but, like... <laughs> I mean, but, but it's exactly why... You know, people, it's like about fans having ownership, you know? And, I, and I, I struggle with this problem a lot, and I wonder, like, is fandom broken right now? Because mm. when Lost was on the air, that's definitely a show that could have had an after show that I certainly would have hosted. <laughs> sure, for sure. Because every episode, it, you know, there were so many characters, there were so many storylines, so much drama, so many the overarching themes, philosophical themes, spiritual themes. And so, uh, you know, I wonder for you guys, like, what do you think that would have been like if that had been in full swing during Lost? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, people have said that to me. They said, look, look at these tiny characters in Game of Thrones that have like a million and a half followers. And right. think about what would happen if Lost was on while social media was around. Not only that, but we, we filmed Lost on Oahu. And, and in, in a lot of different ways, that sheltering of being on the island kept us away from that stuff. I mean, I, I don't think any of us, I mean, we knew, we knew it was a, big show, but I don't think any of us really realised how big until we moved from the island to places like... I remember going to Disneyland at one point and thinking, mm -hmm. I can't do this at the moment. And then, I don't know why, but it was huge in Spain. My family live in Spain. My brother lives in Spain. My parents live in Spain. Oh, muy bien. Yeah, gracias. <laughs> and, um... And that's all my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I think because in England it moved from a terrestrial uh, channel to... A I called my mom. That guy got him from a trip. I always call my mom when I land to make, make her let her know I'm okay. Yeah, shut up about it. <laughs> and so I go, hey. And she goes, oh, did you get in okay? Yeah. And she was like, well, it's, you know, it's raining. You want to be a little careful? What the fuck are you doing there? What are they doing? They did this Darren Rogers last year. Well, if they're going to fuck him, they might as well take him to dinner first. <laughs> so is your seatbelt on? Are you wearing your seatbelt? Like, yeah, she just... Sure. Yeah, she's just like that kind of a sports fan. But for you, at Nerdist Mom on Twitter, you should follow her. She's hilarious. Nice. Um, she's but, but for you, growing up, it's like like I can't retain numbers and math doesn't work in my head either. For you, is it that you can't remember scores, you can't remember players, you don't understand? You understand the sport, right? It just doesn't interest. You know what sounds weird is that yeah, it's that if I can picture myself doing something, then it is of interest to me, and maybe that's just a part of my inherent flawed narcissism. Uh, <laughs> and then people are like, "Well, how come you like Harry Potter so much?" And I'm like, "Cause I can fucking picture being a wizard. That's why." <laughs> so that's. But I mean, there's, I think there's some. I can't picture throwing a ball at someone and having him catch it and go, "Yeah, points." Yeah, you. <laughs> You have to be an absolute tank to be an American football player, but I think you'd be a pretty good, like, pool player. <laughs> I'm good at darts. Table tennis. You know, anything that's inside, anything that's inside. I I'm... love shuffleboard. Shuffleboard's love great. Shuffleboard. Yeah. shuffleboard's great. I can picture myself being on... Oh, oh Doctor Who? Yeah, I yeah. I can picture myself being a... Yeah, yeah. You, you you're a Doctor Who fan. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. What do you... What, you know, Capaldi's maybe going to leave? He's leaving? He is leaving, right? For is sure? he leaving after... Said he said he was going to leave? What, are they doing another episode, another two episodes? I think maybe just the Christmas episode might be the... I think, is it the Christmas episode maybe going to be the last one? But he's he's wrapping it up. Did you did you pr throw your name into the hat? Did you, I, you know, an American cannot... The, I think one of the rules is an American cannot play... I mean... It's, it's like a Bond thing. It's kind of like a Bond thing. And there are, you know, Matt Myra has a theory that James Bond is a Time Lord, and that's why he is... <laughs> that's I like how he's that, I like that. But, you know, some name... Uh, one name that I saw being thrown around was Tilda Swinton that I think would that. be amazing yeah, at yeah. Tilda Swinton. But would you, would you consider... Would yeah, that be something I, I, you? I stuck my name out there just because I think you have to when it comes to Doctor Who because it's such a fandom... <laughs> so 
<laughs> but again, you're like haunting me on social media. When I saw you do that thing where you said, I'm reading that, you know, Tilda Swinton might be yeah. a potential name for the doctor, she'd be amazing. I read that and I went, oh, fuck, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> she is fantastic, Tilda Swinton. I loved her in Doctor Strange, that moment. Oh, yeah. The moment where she realises that she's struggling with her death, that beautiful moment where she says, I've been here so many times and right at this you moment... can't see past yeah, that. I yeah, I can't work out what to do. I just thought that was a beautiful... I feel like she's the ancient one. And every... But then she's also great in Snowpiercer. Did you see Snowpiercer? Yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. She, everything she's in, she's just so... She's brilliant in the beach. She's so sexy in the beach. Yeah. I find her... it's like the lap thing. Every time they do it on a plane, you know, when they give you a cushion, I'm like... Yeah. Oh, you don't want I... that cushion? Just... Hey, get... <laughs> fuck the cushion. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> Mine's... Hiding a backup microphone in case our mics die, and it's hiding my phone, uh, which I, if I don't have it within proximity of me, I, my brain melts. I'm having, like, in the past couple of years, so major problems with my phone in terms of my connection to it and the way that I feel about it. You mean, like, like too much of an addiction? <sighs> yeah, I just, I, I, I'm start, I've, I've been having some anxiety with the fact that I can't seem to get myself away from my phone in terms of the life that I have and the career that I have. And I've said for a long time now, I want to not have a cell phone. And obviously, my agent says, that's ridiculous. <laughs> my mum and dad are like, oh, that's fine, do it. But my agent's like, you can't not have a cell phone. And I said, well, you know, not that I'm Bill Murray, but, you know, Bill Murray has an answer machine and not an agent, supposedly, and people just call him. I feel like Bill machine. Murray has, like, a carrier pigeon that just <laughs> finds him wherever he is, and then he gets a thing, and then he just shows up, yeah. like, at a bar mitzvah or something. But you know those things where you, you, you say those comments, and then eventually you have to get to a point where you say, I can't keep just saying this, I have to... You actually it. have to do it, yeah. And, and I'm not... I think generations underneath us obviously have major problems with not being able to get away from their phone. And I'm not completely impossible, oh, yeah. but it, it makes me feel anxious. And from a physical point of view, I have problems with the end of my index finger, the end of my middle finger, and a little section of my hand. Oh, poor little monkey, you oh! okay? Is your hand okay? No, but I'm serious. It's, it's, see that little dark section there? <laughs> This is, by the way, this for a man, this is a severe injury. You have to understand. We have low pain thresholds. Look, it's like, all. Yeah, I know. But honestly, this is, this is not like. <laughs> but no, but it's it's not the weight of the phone. Yeah, I but feel you're just like a the little... badness of the of the mobile phone. It's and getting into like, your phone. It's going the radiation, the, the evilness think... of it. I mean, th there there's no question that there is that, that we uh, have an addiction. That there is a tremendous social media addiction. Mm. I, I mean, I. It feels weird when you don't have it near you and you just feel like, well, I, I'm disconnected from everything that's going on. Yeah. But if you spent, you know, if you'd really lost your phone and you lived away somewhere for a few days, you would readjust. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. Like, I, I go to Peru usually for about three weeks at the end of the year and there's no cell phones that work there. And for the first day or two, the, my friends that I'm with, because I'm a little bit more used to it now, my friends that I'm with are, are, are anxious about you know, doing this and stuff. And I said, well, it will not work. It will not work. Don't even try it. And then what you, what you find is that at dinner time, at lunch time, in terms of social situations, yeah. everyone's much more chatty and the, the anxiety kind of leaves us, you know. In some way, I slightly blame you for my phone. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay, I'll take the blame. Because Why? years ago, when I did Attack of the Show... Yeah, you G4, and I, yeah. You and I, May yeah. and peace. Good job. You, you and I were chatting, that's great too, or, or at the end of your life, that's fantastic as well. But if you can do it when you're young, it means you get a jump on that career. So I always tell people to try and think about that being the most important question. And then from there, I'm a big uh, believer in intention, which is one of the major reasons I think that I've been able to navigate into things that I want to do. Think about that thing that you want to do in the future and then spend a lot of time creating that picture of the life that you're going to walk into. This is something that JJ and I talked about a lot. Um, you know, I admire JJ and what he's achieved in his life. And, you know, when I, was a, when I was a younger man, I would say, you know, how did you do these things and how do you have this ability to do that stuff? And JJ would say to me, look, I project into my future the things that I want to happen and I imagine myself walking into that life. And that's kind of served me well. And the greater detail you can picture it, the yes. better it serves you. Yes. What I understand. And there's a, there's a lot of tricks, if you will, uh, that you can do that, that kind of appear to be a little pretentious or a little over the top where you can write down your goals and, you know, laminate them and put them in your shower or put them on your front door. Or I, I put post-it notes sometimes on my uh, little, not the rearview mirror, but the little... What, vanity mirrors? Is that what you call that? In the, the, yeah, and the little, yeah, the yeah. little flip down. Yeah. I'll put things on that sometimes. And I also, look, I'm doing it right now. <laughs>
Hang on. I'm wearing... Hang on. Where is it? Find escaped centipede. <laughs> <laughs> See this thing here? I'm wearing an elastic band. Now, this band that I wear allows me to get out of any headspace that I don't think is worthwhile. So if I'm thinking about something that I think is not uh, valuable in my life, I'll snap this, and it'll send a message to my brain, don't do that. That is fucking genius. I've never thought to do that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it just... It just... It, it, it's, a, it's a trick, if you will, because if, you, if your brain starts to associate things with even an annoyance, which it doesn't hurt, it's an annoyance, if your brain starts to associate with that, it will try and veer away from that eventually. And also, it's just that thing of when you lose your train of thought. You can be so focused on something and someone goes, hey, Dom, what? Oh, shit, I forgot what I was... Yeah, and, yeah. and if that's a negative thing, then that's a great way to get out of it. That is one of the best pieces of advice I, I've ever heard. Sweet, dude. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you all for being here and enjoying this fan journey down the pathway we call Dominic Monaghan. Check out Dominic's new show. Uh, I'm sorry, check out Dom's new movie, Atomica. Uh, and let us know what you think of the show. We're at Talking on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, probably even uh, Friendster and MySpace, you guys. We'll put you in our top eight. Um, uh, you guys are also a big part of the show. Always check with us because no matter who we're talking to or what we're talking about, we always want to hear from you. So thank you so much. Huge hand for Dom. Uh, at Dom's Wild Things on Twitter. Uh, follow him. Learn from him. Enjoy his work. Uh, thank you so much again. I'm Chris Hardwick. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Say next time on Talking with Chris Hardwick. Uh, would you, would you, if you were a doctor, do you have a signature? Like, what would your, what would your Well, signature? my whole thing is curiosity, right? I mean, I, I like, grew up uh, with So you're this... dressed like a cat? <laughs> I'm the cat doctor. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up with this quote from Einstein, which is, um, blessed are the curious, for they shall have adventures. Sure. And I always thought, wow, that's, a, that's an amazing quote. And I have this sticker that says, be curious, which we give out to people whenever we go traveling. So I think the idea for me as a doctor would be, uh, I'm interested in the minutia. I'm interested in how things work. I'm interested right. in, in the microscopic thing. I have microscopes around my house and, you know, obviously interested in insects, insects which are the smallest type of uh, animals, apart from bacteria and stuff. Um, so I like the little things and how the little things p come together to make big things. So I think the vibe of my doctor would be one of curiosity and examination. More of a literal doctor, in right. that sense. You know, someone examining stuff, a detective type thing. Um, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to work out what's missing from the, from the doctor now. Like, what what is needed. And I, I think maybe a woman doctor would be a great I think it'd be great. It, you know? Yeah, I think it'd be great. Because then it I opens mean, it all up. Yeah. Because obviously a man can come back, but if... Well, it's, 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 they're aliens. The Time Lords are aliens. They could be, like, it, it's a concept of gender right. here. Human gender and physiology doesn't, necess doesn't have to, you know... I mean, sure. I know they got two hearts, but, you know, it doesn't, doesn't yeah. really... Beyond that. And, and Tilda Swinton, who, who's beautiful and statuesque, she does have an alien-like quality to her, you know? Very ethereal. An otherworldly. Yeah. So I think she'd be great. I heard Kate Blanchett was being talked about as well. But, really? Yeah. Holy shit. I mean, it's, it's hard she, going out. She'd be a great master. I think she'd be a great yeah, master. Yeah, yeah. Because you've never... You, you, you know, she's just so... She, could, she just gets so absorbed in everything that she does. Yeah. I think she'd be such a great... I think she'd be a great master. I agree. There, there's two TV shows that terrified me when I was a kid. Uh, one was... I don't know if you guys remember Wurzel Gummidge. I don't even think it came out over here. Those aren't real words. No, well, it has a slight, it has a slight Doctor Who uh, connection because John Pertwee played uh -huh. Wurzel yep. Gummidge. And it, so it's the story of a, of a scarecrow who's, based on his personality, able to take his head off and replace his head with, like, evil Wurzel or, like... It's a children's show? Yeah, it's a children's show. It's terrifying. <laughs> so he'd, like, twist his head around and then put on, like you know, athletic Wurzel or, like, smart Wurzel or evil Wurzel, which was terrifying. So my mum and dad said that I would be uh, scared of that. And then in, the, in Doctor Who, when the, you have that explosion at the end of the yeah. uh, closing... or Was it the closing credits or the opening credits where you'd have the big explosion? Maybe the closing credits. For which... Doctor Who. It yeah. Would, it would go ping! Like, oh, at, yeah, at, the, well, at the very end? At the, very, at the beginning, was, there was the ping, and then it would go through, and then at the end. So at the end, I think when I was a kid, the very end credits, it would, you know, show the director, and then it'd go... And my mum and dad said I'd be, like, hiding behind the sofa. <laughs> but that, I think, is still probably loose in my house, or hopefully will have escaped and gone outside, which is beautiful. It's all part of nature. And then... Is that a, is that a, dang, is that a particularly dangerous... It's venomous. It's venomous. So, I mean, a bite from it is... It, it won't kill you, but it is extremely painful. It, it, like, causes necrosis in the area that it bites, so... 
that part of your body is going to Necrosis gonna is a bad, you know, necro, like, that means death. Yeah, like, yeah, that's not, dead tissue. It will cause pretty, pretty bad scarring in that area. And then a friend of mine and his wife, uh, people that come over to my house kind of know this is, you know, there's the potential of this happening. A friend of mine and his wife were staying at my house, and I said to him, look, there's like a six-foot jet black snake in my house, which I'm pretty sure at this point has left my house, but if you see it, let me know. So... <laughs> And it was big, like the biggest, big, like about. Are you as dating as... anyone? Are they cool with this stuff? <laughs> yeah, they're okay with it. Everyone's all right. So you know, it's about as big as this as this couch. So I was in Brazil, in the Pantanal, the, the kind of open grassland of, of uh, Brazil, and he called me, and he never calls me when I'm on location because he's in the industry as well, and he kind of knows that you know it's it's, it's, it's not going to work. Wait, out. you're talking about the snake? The snake called <laughs> you? Yeah, the snake called me. Hey, where are the chips? So where so do my... you keep your mice? Yeah, where's all the food? <laughs> I'm starving. <laughs> So my friend Nigel uh, calls me and says, hey, uh, we just opened up the trash can to put some trash away, and there's a big black snake in the trash can. What do we do about it? And I said, go upstairs and grab one of my... I have a whole bunch of terrariums upstairs in my house just in case sure things do. happen. <laughs> so I was like, go upstairs, grab this terrarium, put it inside. He's like, is it, is it dangerous? Is it venomous? I was like, no, it's fine. So he puts it in. I said, did you, did you close the, the, uh, the roof? He said, yeah. And I said, OK, it is venomous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not dangerously venomous, or it's a rear fang no, it's snake. Like any even it needs to grab hold of you and bite you for a long time to cause an injury. But the, the, <laughs> the, the good thing about that, the positive thing about that, is that because the snake was rooting around in the trash can, it was getting desperate for food. And I said to Nigel, what you did was probably save that snake's life. Go out and buy a couple of mice in the next couple of days and you'll save its life. And he did, and it was a worthwhile story. So, yeah. Now, I have, a, I have a present for you. This is, this, this is for you uh, right here. This is a drive shaft poster. I, I do want to, just really quick, thank you so much, Victoria. I want to talk, I don't know if you guys have seen, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Wild Things, Dom's show that was, uh, it was here we carried on BBC America. And, uh, and the thing that I've always loved about you is you really just do stuff that you're excited about. Like, it doesn't seem to me that you're even saying, like, well, I, you know, I felt like it was the right time to leave Lost for that character, so I did that. I, I, you know, I love animals, I love insects, I'm going to do a show about it. You know, this, you weren't just a gun for hire on, well, let's just put this actor on this nature show. This was something that was very passionate to you. So when did your love of animals and insects, because and, I have a massive insect collection. They're all in frames. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't run around rooting around my trash. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I, I also am a, a huge insect. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an entomologist. I'm an insect. This, um, this video game last year... I can't remember the name of. Anyone remember the name of that film? Super Mario <laughs> Pac-Man. Some Xbox game. I think that's embarrassing. I can't remember Xbox the name Pac-Man. Probably. Um, and um, I'm not going to remember it. And uh, they called me and said, oh, Pet's up and running again. And I said, well, I'm, I'm 10 years older. So I met the director and said, wouldn't it be... It's almost like the same story that I had with uh, JJ about Charlie. I said, wouldn't it be even more tragic if this guy who's supposed to be in his mid-20s and is sad and has no friends and has a bad relationship with his family, never had a girlfriend, what if he was in his mid-30s and all those things were true? And the director said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So then we filmed it in... I'm glad it was now, because I think it just made... It just made so, when you see the movie, it'll all make sense to you. And again, stick with it, because you'll think it's one kind of movie and you really need to see how it... Yeah, how it plays out because yeah. it's real uncomfortable in the beginning. Yeah, where you're like, I'm supposed to. This is supposed to be the protagonist. Yeah, you know, well, it's, it says underneath a love story, and you just think, okay, this is going to be creepy guy meets girl, and he's going to be a, 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 like treating her poorly, and that's kind of the movie. But like Chris said, it's not. We would we would watch it at these screenings, and we'd, I'd seen it so many times that I would jump out and get food or, or go get a cup of tea or something, and I'd come in for that moment where they go, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and I'd leave. There's the, a few of those moments the audience in there. Do, they're like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, it's fun. And Ksenia Solo, who plays the girl, she was is great, absolutely fantastic. She's so, great. what is Atomica? Do you want to tell me about Atomica? Yeah, Atomica. Man, uh, Atomica is this film that I did before Pet. It was originally called um, Deep Burial. It's a story of a lady who gets a call that a underground nuclear center base uh, has stopped communicating with the outside world. So she goes to check out why they why they've lost communication. When she gets there, she finds me. I play a character called Robinson, who seems to be a little crazy, but he has spent two years underground in this bunker on his own. And he tells her that the other gentleman that's in the bunker with him went crazy and tried to kill him. And he doesn't know where he is in this bunker. It's like two miles long, this bunker. So she tries to find him. When she eventually does find that guy, played by Tom Sizemore. Great, great casting. Great casting. Great. 
Tom Sizemore says, my character went crazy and tried to kill him. So it's a who done it, who do you trust whilst the world is about to explode. Um, it's fun. It's myself, Sarah Habel, uh, Tom Sizemore. We filmed in Washington State in an in a actual non-working anymore, underground bunker. Oh, wow. Yeah, full of bats and owls and centipedes. <laughs> oh, I absolutely Oh, my God, it. that must have been like, I love it. stop playing with the bugs. We need to come to do this, please. We <laughs> need to shoot it. now. I loved it. I love caves and I love creatures that live in caves because they have all these adaptations that we don't have because we don't live in caves. And there'd be all these bizarre creatures and, yeah, most people would get scared and I'd be like, give me a minute, there's a bat over here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig through the poop and find some smaller... ...next year. And he said, well, we're going to bring you back, I'm sure, for reshoots. And we would come back for between six to eight to ten weeks of reshoots each year for three years. Oh, my God. And that's like making, as you know, that's like making three, two or three movies in, yeah. those, in those ten weeks, you know. So we came back, and then we did this insane press run at the, uh, in the Christmas period when the films came out. So it was funny, because Pete could see the long game. So when we were all crying at the rap party, he's like, oh, we had so much fun, we'll never see you again. He's like, we're going to hang out for the next decade. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about you it. You will not be able to wait to get yeah. this all yeah, over true. with. Yeah. That was great. We were, I went to uh, Japan with Pete to, to promote, I think it was Two Towers, myself, Elijah, Pete... Liv Tyler, and Pete's a huge Beatles fan, and the only way that you can get Pete to do anything is to, is to kind of get him, you know, interested in the Beatles, and I'm a massive Beatles fan too. And there was a Beatles bar where Japanese people would sing Beatles songs, and it's the only time we've managed to get Peter Jackson out. He came out, we had a few drinks, we took photos together, and again, it's one of those moments that sticks in your head because he's, he's quite shy and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't really do a huge amount. Pete, he's got yeah. a family and a wife, obviously. But I remember we were at dinner and I just said, we're going to go to this Japanese bar where they play Beatles songs. And he was like, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so if you want to trap Peter Jackson, that's the way to do it. Sure. <laughs> Pete, it's Paul McCartney. Do you want to come out and play? <laughs> I got right there. <laughs> we, were at, um, we, were at, we were at the Vanity Fair party. We were lucky enough to get invited to the Vanity Fair party for Return of the King. And I was there with Elijah and Pete, and we were talking about something, and someone came over to Peter Jackson and said, uh, Paul McCartney's coming in, he'd like to see you. <laughs> and Pete just turned around to me, because he knew, knew how much that was a big deal, to both of us, myself and Elijah, he went, oh, Paul McCartney. And I said, I can't, I gotta go, man. I can't meet him, I can't do that. Like, I was too scared that, like, that whatever, what are you going to say to Paul McCartney? We had him on the podcast. I had him on the podcast. It's just like... You know, oh, I love your music. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> and what if he says, whatever, and then Beatles music's ruined for the rest of your life? Like, I just, <laughs> so I ran off. He, he met Elijah and Pete, and, and they chatted, and I just said, I, I can't do it. It's too, it's too precious to me. I'll tell you about, you know, we... Uh, well, you know, we could probably cut this out of the show, because this, this is about me and not you, but... Uh, Let's talk about well, you. Well, okay, so, we had, so we, had, we had... Paul McCartney agreed to come on the podcast, came on a couple years ago. And uh, he just couldn't have been nicer. And, and How's I, going, Chris? And he really was. He really was. We went to his office in New York. You know, you know, what's, really, you know what's really funny is that uh, sometimes people come on the podcast and they'll bring a big posse. And it's like, oh, you're like the third lead on a thing and right, you've right. got like nine people. Paul McCartney, we just went into his office alone. Nice. Um, talked to him. And, and I guess I kind of realized like, you know, how many people really just talk to him like a dude? How many yeah, people yeah. just talk to him like a person? So we just talked to him like yeah. a guy. And, you and know, that's all he wants. And that's all he wants. You know, he really wants to be a part of the human experience. As much as you want to be a part of the Beatles experience, he wants to be a part of the human experience. And so, you know, he's like, people want to take pictures all the time. And I'm like, can't we just have a conversation? Yeah, it's a you know, can we from the movie. So I will take it. One of the things I do, which is really funny, is I'll, if it's a movie that meant a lot to me or a TV show, I'll frame my first call sheet of the, of yeah. the shoot and then the last call sheet. And I have that for Lord of the Rings. So it's like, you know, the first one and then, like, Two and a half years later, the last one, because it was... Did you hear what happened with the audience just now? Oh. They were like, I didn't think you could get any more fuckable, but... Oh, <laughs> so adorable. So adorable. Thank you, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, man. So, uh, you know, as, as we're kind of wrapping this up, and now you have this, this snake uh, to take home, um, do you have any kind of parting wisdom or advice for... As someone who I said seems well-adjusted, seems to only pursue stuff that you're very passionate about, you know, what do you say to people? Like, how do you find what you're passionate about? How do you pursue what you're passionate about? Like, what are some, what are some parting words of wisdom that you can give to people? Oh, man, I don't know about wisdom. I'm still trying to work it out myself. I think you always are, and hopefully yeah, yeah. you always feel like you're a student of life. But, but, but at this point, what would you say? Yeah, um, I mean, the things that have served me over the years and seem to continue to do the same, and anytime I have the opportunity to talk to young people, or college students or university people, I always say... 
do you know what you're intending on doing? Do you know what you, you're thinking about doing, you know, as a career? And the people that say yes, I say, that's fantastic, go for it. And the people that say, I'm not sure yet, I say, so this is the question to meditate on. This is the question to spend some time on, is to sit in those, in those times where you have the opportunity to think and meditate on what do I want to do? Because I think one of the luckiest gifts you can give to yourself is to know what you've decided to be your purpose at a young age. I mean, if it happens midway through your life, that's great too. Or, or at the end of your life, that's fantastic as well. But if you can do it when you're young, it means you get a jump on that career. So I always tell people to try and think about that being the most important question. And then from there, I'm a big uh, believer in intention, which is one of the major reasons I think that I've been able to navigate into things that I want to do. Think about that thing that you want to do in the future and then spend a lot of time creating that picture of the life that you're going to walk into. This is something that JJ and I talked about a lot. Um, you know, I admire JJ and what he's achieved in his life. And, you know, when I, was a, when I was a younger man, I would say, you know, how did you do these things and how do you have this ability to do that stuff? And JJ would say to me, look, I project into my future the things that I want to happen and I imagine myself walking into that life. And that's kind of served me well. And the greater detail you can picture it, the yes. better it serves you. Yes. What I understand. And there's a, there's a lot of tricks, if you will, uh, that you can do that, that kind of appear to be a little pretentious or a little over the top where you can write down your goals and, you know, laminate them and put them in your shower or put them on your front door. Or I, I put post-it notes sometimes on my uh, little, not the rearview mirror, but the little, what, vanity mirror? Is that what you call that? In the... Yeah, and the little, yeah, the yeah. little flip down. Yeah. I'll put things on that sometimes. And I also, look, I'm doing it right now. Not only to get on a show, but get on a show that stays on the air and then have that show be a hit show. Yeah. So to kind of help make the choice to leave is a, that's, not, that's, a, that's scary as fuck, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you, you never know. This business is so mercurial and you don't know. So how do you, you know, how do you as, as Dom go, you know, this is right, this serves the story, but I'm still, there are other things that I know I'm going to be able to go on to do or I'm going to be okay. How do you know you're going to be okay? Yeah, I work on instincts a lot, and I, you know me by now, I like scary shit, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I like things that, that force me to be in the moment, and being in the moment for me is, is either being around kids, because they always force you to be in the moment, yeah. or around animals, or putting yourself into a life uh, situation where you're like, it could go one way or the other, and I'm not, I'm not playing it safe. I, I'm not interested in playing things safe, you know. Uh, in terms of, like, what you said, you know, a, a show is, they always talk about this thing of, like, uh, lightning in a bottle, you know, capturing lightning in a bottle. My, my brother and my dad, who obviously I adore, are extremely snobby about <laughs> TV and film, you know. <laughs> so I'll be like, you know, what, what do you think of this? And they go, ah, oh, it was all right, but I didn't really like it. And I'm always, I'm always saying to them, guys, just to write that thing and get it accepted, just to have that thing that's accepted, get the money to turn it into a, a film, just yeah. to cast it even slightly correctly, all of these working parts to get yourself on set. And in a, in a heartbeat, you're like, nah, I didn't like the ending. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, you know, that, that is it's kind of funny, just going back to the social media thing, that, that, that is one thing that totally gets under my skin, is, is when people are just dismissive of stuff, like... What did you make for the last three months? Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. like yeah. this shit's hard. Come yeah, on, yeah, yeah. you know. They say it's you know it's rubbish or whatever. Or they do this. You know, I'm obviously a big Manchester United fan, and, and lots of people. Yeah, oh no, nice, yeah. uh, that's cricket, yeah. soccer. Yeah, L lots of people who don't appreciate a certain player will say, you know, he's rubbish or he's fat. This guy Wayne Rooney, who scored more goals for Manchester United than any other player in the history of football, 250 goals. Uh, um, I already forgot everything you just said. <laughs> My, my brain does not absorb sports, but I so, understand he's good. So to put it into context, he scored more goals for England than any other player, scored more goals for Manchester United, the most successful English team of all time, than any other player. He's a record breaker times two in, a, in an elite fashion. And people say, he's rubbish, he's fat, he's crap. He's not fat, do you know what I mean? He, <laughs> he might look slightly bigger than other players, but if you put him with the man on the street running, he would slay you, he'd absolutely slay yeah. you. And his skill level, like, he might not be as good as the elite players he plays around now, but his skill level in terms of, like, you or, not, you or I, yeah. he'd make us look like we're wearing shoes on the wrong foot. I tell you, I, for one, am shocked. I personally expected more from soccer fans. I had <laughs> no idea that it was so toxic. And oh, so my God. When you want to talk about toxicity and fandom, yeah, yeah. like, that, that's where you... I mean, listen, I might get shit online for nerd stuff, but 
ancient one. And, but then she's also great in Snowpiercer. Did you see Snowpiercer? Yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. She, everything she's in, she's just so... She's brilliant in the beach. She's so sexy in the beach. Yeah. I find her really sexy and uh, very kind of mysterious and very Time Lordy. Um, uh, would, you, would you, if you were a doctor, do you have a signature? Like, what would your... Well, signature? my whole thing is curiosity, right? I mean, I, I like, grew up uh, with So you dress like a cat? <laughs> I'm the cat doctor, meow. <laughs> I, I grew up with this quote from Einstein, which is, um, blessed are the curious, for they shall have adventures. Sure. And I always thought, wow, that's, a, that's an amazing quote. And I have this sticker that says, be curious, which we give out to people whenever we go traveling. So I think the idea for me as a doctor would be... Uh, I'm interested in the minutia. I'm interested in how things work. I'm interested right. in, in the microscopic thing. I have microscopes around my house and, you know, obviously interested in insects, insects which are the smallest type of uh, animals, apart from bacteria and stuff. Um, so I like the little things and how the little things p come together to make big things. So I think the vibe of my doctor would be one of curiosity and examination, more of a literal doctor in right that sense you know someone examining stuff a detective type thing um but i'm trying to i'm trying to work out what's missing from the from the doctor now like what what is needed and i, I think maybe a woman doctor would be a great i think it'd be great to, you know? yeah i think it'd be great because then it I opens mean, it all up yeah because obviously a man can come back but if well, it's, it's, they're aliens. The Time Lords are aliens. They could be, like, it's a concept of gender right. here. Human gender and physiology doesn't, necess doesn't have to, you know, I mean, sure. I know they got two hearts, but, you know, it doesn't, doesn't yeah. really, beyond that. And, and Tilda Swinton, who, who's beautiful and statuesque, she does have an alien-like quality to her, you know? Very ethereal. An otherworldly yeah. thing. So I think she'd be great. I heard Kate Blanchett was being talked about as well. But, really? Yeah. Holy shit. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> hard she, now. She'd be a great master. I think she'd be a great yeah, master. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you've never, you, you you know, she's just so she could she just gets so absorbed in everything that she does. Yeah, I think she'd be such a great. I think she'd be a great master. I agree. There, there was two TV shows that terrified me when I was a kid. Uh, one was I don't know if you guys remember Wurzel Gummidge. I don't even think it came out over here. Those aren't real words. No, well, <laughs> it has a slight it has a slight <laughs> Doctor Who uh, connection because John Pertwee played uh -huh. Wurzel yep. Gummidge, and it, so it's the story of a, of a scarecrow who's, based on his personality, able to take his head off and replace his head with, like, evil Wurzel or, like... It's a children's show? Yeah, it's a children's show. It's terrifying. <laughs> so he'd, like, twist his head around and then put on, like, you know, athletic Wurzel or, like, smart Wurzel or evil Wurzel, which was terrifying. So my mum and dad said that I would be uh, scared of that. And then in, the, in Doctor Who, when the, you have that explosion at the end of the yeah. uh, closing... or Was it the closing credits or the opening credits where you'd have the big explosion? Maybe the closing credits. For which... Doctor Who. It yeah. Would, it would go, I actually think, in the, grand, in the grand scheme of things, I think Billy Boyd kissed more members of the Fellowship than she did. <laughs> it's a completely different story. Yeah, uh, I have a special thing for you, though. Where is it? Oh, here it is. This is, a very, this is very special. Oh, Elvin Cloak, you're going to disappear. Your, uh, yes. This is for you. There you go. You disappeared. <laughs> Uh, remember, you guys can always be uh, a part of this program here on this show. Uh, just reach out to us on all platforms, at Talking is the handle. Uh, we're going to let you know who our guests are. You can ask them anything. We'll try to incorporate it in the show as best we can. We'll be right back with more Dominic Monaghan on Talking is the Handle. Position. We're back. I'm sitting ve very romantic. I feel like this is a first date, and I just keep creeping closer. Like I'm, li I'm liking it. I'm liking what it. What do you, you know? I thought the U-shaped couch would be good because it's sort of like, you know, it's a little. But I, but I wonder if it's maybe because you don't know what to do with your legs just, the whole time. I can't. I can't yeah. do that anymore. This. I'm sitting up like a. So tell me about everything. <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know if you. Uh, Don, on Dom's Instagram, there was a Lord of the Rings reunion post. That, mini, a mini one, a mini one. That, oh, of course, they're hobbits. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there they are. So what is happening here? Oh, yeah. not all hobbits. 
Uh, it's uh, three hobbits, an elf, and a human, right? Yeah. Um, what are you guys doing we, in that hunting lodge? We, <laughs> we went to a place called, is it called Ed, Ed Bergen's on uh, oh, ba, uh, Fair, uh, Fairfax? Ed, ba, Bob Bergen's? Ed, Ed, Bob Bergen's? Maybe. Tom Bergen's. Tom Bergen's. Tom Bergen's, yeah. Uh, we went there because, um, obviously, Vigo was nominated for a, a bunch of uh, movies this year, uh, for a bunch of awards, sorry, for Captain Fantastic. And we had said, you know, we'd like to be around and celebrate that with you if you're into it. So for the Oscars, he was in town and he said to us, all the kids from Captain Fantastic were so excited that they were working with Aragorn and they talked a lot about Lord of the Rings. And he said, as a surprise, if you show up at this place, you're going to, you know, freak them out. So we all showed up. And then I'm pr outside of, a, well, alongside Elijah, I'm probably one of the more active on social media. And I had said, look, we need to document this because even though we're having fun, we need to show the people who are on social media that we have as much fun being together as those guys want us to be together. Yeah. So we, we did it like that. Oh, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah, and then uh, I, think, I think that was that was on the Saturday. And then on the Sunday, Billy and I went over to Vigo's to watch the most extraordinary Super Bowl of all time. I mean, I'm not that crazy about the Super Bowl, but...